is that the sign you started is back. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, buenos días. Quiero darle uh, la más cordial bien bienvenida a todos los que se encuentran aquí y a los que nos siguen en línea también. Uh, my name is Pierre Lawson. I'm the Associate Director at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute. Throughout the day, you're going to hear from scholars, librarians, archivists who are going to share their thoughts about the present and the future of the digital humanities in the field of Caribbean studies. Uh, you will, of course, hear about uh, projects linked to the Dominican Republic, but it was particularly important for us to present a conversation that would transcend uh, national borders and the, the geography of the so many islands of the region. So I'm pleased uh, to wel also welcome today uh, esteemed colleagues who will share their own experiences from a Cuban, Puerto Rican, Haitian, French Caribbean, Dutch Caribbean perspective, or also a pan or a trans Caribbean perspective. Uh, one note for those of you who are following us online, if you have questions for our panelists, uh, please use the Q&A uh, function on Zoom. And as moderators, we'll do our best to, uh, to, to convey and relay those questions to the panelists. And if we do lack time, uh, we will forward the questions to hopefully continue the conversation afterwards. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, uh, speaker for this morning, Dr. Renata Miller, uh, who is the Dean of the Division of Humanities uh, and the Arts here at City College. <laughs> Good morning. I am humbled and honored to be here with you this morning, um, offering opening remarks at this incredible conference. Um, I say I'm honored and humbled because uh, for as long as I've been at City College, which is 20 years now, the work in Dominican Studies at City College, I remember when it was when DSI was first made at the Dominican Studies Institute. And Sarah, how long have you existed now? Has I been to 1992. Oh, okay. But but I remember when it was in a, in a growth period in the early 20th and 21st century. Um, and so for as long as I've been here, the Dominican Studies Institute has really been in the vanguard in so many ways. Um, it embraced the notion that City College should be uh, representative of New York City as the crossroads of so many cultures. It embraced the notion that City College should provide a home for preserving for preserving and making accessible archives uh, that have to do with the diverse cultures of New York City um, and the world. And it also has been in the vanguard in digital humanities. When the Division of Humanities and the Arts decided it wanted to develop a community of practice around digital humanities and pursued and secured a couple of NEH grants to that end, uh, it was the DSI. Um, and their incredible staff, the great team that, Ramon, that Ramona has assembled here, um, that was a resource for us as we thought about the types of digital humanities work that we would pursue in humanities and the arts. Um, so I, the, so uh, the work that, uh, that this institute does um, in assembling scholars, in bringing visiting scholars like Margo uh, to spend the year with us um, and the intellectual exchange that it enables, the access that it provides and the scholarship that it enables um, around the world um, really is unparalleled. And so um, I want to thank DSI for bring, ma making this conference possible today um, and for all of the work that they do day in and day out uh, in promoting the world's work in, work in Dominican studies um, and Caribbean studies and serving as a model for all the possibilities in digital humanities. So with no further ado, I welcome you all and um, I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you, Dean Miller. Uh, I would now like to introduce Dr. Margot Bonnerwood, who is really the mastermind behind this event. Um, she will soon be finishing her tenure at City College. Um, and at the Dominican Studies Institute as our first uh, full Bright Scholar in residence. Um, she comes from the University of Curaçao, where she is a senior lecturer. And um, I think that throughout the, the year, she's had the opportunity to continue her research on her many topics of interest. And those include the relationship between the Dutch Caribbean and the Dominican Republic, but also the digital humanities. And so she's really the one who uh, suggested that we should have this event today.
Thank you so much, uh, Pierre, and everyone uh, here for being present here online. And um, I just want, uh, there's so much I can say, and I'm not going to do that. We are going to talk a lot today. What I want to emphasize uh, now are two things, and that's friendship and gratitude. Uh, for me, living and working in the Caribbean now since 2008 is so, has changed me myself so much as a person. And uh, the, the friendship of working together uh, on the islands, within, you know, in the institutes, in organizations like Ecoreal, and I know you're out there online um, uh, with people. These are relationships I have, relationships, working relationships I have never had before experienced. And it's the same warmth that I uh, experienced here. So also I want to share my gratitude for the Dominican Studies Institute for hosting me here. I stand here a little emotional because it's a bittersweet sort of last big thing that we do here in my almost, no, it just started last month here, uh, but I'm sure it will again be a lasting uh, cooperation. And I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for how the ideas that we had about, because mastermind, thank you, Pierre, it's a compliment. But this is all about how, when people work in the same area, sometimes ideas resonate so strongly. And the idea that resonated so strongly is that doing things in a digital environment, as a scholar, as a librarian, um, is very much ad hoc, where we do not want it to be ad hoc. So what we have in common is this drive, this ambition to be in conversation and to sort of start looking a little bit, you know, on a higher level on how the strategy, how the vision can develop and how we can cooperate from shared visions. Um, and that really is what I want to share with you as the idea behind today. And today is not just about today, it's about continuing friendships, and cooperation. So thank you all, and I'm very much looking forward to today. Thank you. Hey, and the last person I want to introduce is someone who absolutely needs no introduction because she <laughs> basically owns the place. <laughs> Uh, Professor Sarah Conte is our chief librarian uh, here at the Dominican Studies, and she and her team welcome you uh, whenever you need. So we we hope to see you often and, and soon. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I do own the place. Look at it. I have these five years in there. <laughs> Buenos dias. Um, Buenos dias. As the founder and chief librarian of the Kenny Dominican State Institute, I am delighted to welcome you in person and in Las Nubes to this day of sharing and well learning about the world of digital humanities, specifically in the Caribbean or with Caribbean collections. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for accepting our invitation and for your welcoming remarks. I would like to express our deepest gratitude to Dr. Ramona Hernandez. Uh, she is our director, and she will be joining us uh, later on. And she will bring her class. Yes. In addition, I would like to thank Dr. Pierre Lawson, our recently hired associate director, who with grace and professionalism has assumed his position and was instrumental in organizing this event. Thank you to Dr. Margot Grunwood, who came up with the idea of this event and excited us all. Us, us all. Thank you to research assistant Penelope Pejada for her amazing work behind this. And muchísimas gracias, Penelope, por ahí anda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, to librarian Jason Ortiz, uh, who's right there, archivist Jesse Perez, who he might be around. Yes, thank you. And library archives assistant uh, Justin Garson will be taking photos today. Thank you for that and for your great work and support. Uh, it has been a treat to work with them in coordinating this hybrid event. Uh, we have librarians, archivists here from our own city college libraries and uh, Salon and also the New York Public Library. So thank you so much for that. They're going to be joining us uh, throughout the day. Uh, thank you so much for your support and for doing things. Lastly, thank you so much for, to all presenters and panelists for accepting our invitation. 
and I, don't, I cannot uh, forget this, our dearest uh, former assistant director, Anthony Stevens of Ferreira, is here today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to be hearing about the digital collections that we have. Many of those uh, were ideas that came from that beautiful mind. <laughs> And uh, oh my God, we have the dean, the newly <laughs> hired dean of the library, City College Library. Thank you, Mario Ramirez, and of course Professor Carlos. I mean, if I could begin mentioning people, like, I love you all. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Que aprendamos y compartamos mucho. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. <laughs> One minute. We're setting up the first panel. One is sort of ready. Uh, Thank you again for being here. And we are going to start now with some real content. And the buildup of the program is that we start with, you know, a sort of overview of what's going on um, here at DSI, uh, but also in uh, sort of you know, our brothers and sisters uh, institutes. And we, I'm extremely pleased, we're, we all are extremely pleased that today we have as speakers here in the room, Christelle Fustino Diaz, uh, from uh, she's director of uh, research programs and public uh, humanities um, at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College here in New York. Um, we have online um, Amanda or Amanda Moreno, archivist and chair of the Cuban Heritage Collection in Miami University of uh, Miami. Uh, then um, Elizabeth Pierre Louis is a present. Um, hello, Amanda, we can now also see your face, that's nice. Um, Elizabeth Pierre-Louis from Haiti, she is program director of the uh, Fondation Connaissance et Liberté, Focal, um, and I love that knowledge and liberty, what else do we need in life? <laughs> um, at, and Port-au-Prince in uh, Haiti. Um, and we have the esteemed colleagues uh, of here, Sarah Ponte and Jensen Ortiz uh, of CUNY um, DSI Library. Um, I will be moderating this uh, session. Uh, we have agreed as uh, order uh, to start with Amanda, if you uh, are okay with that, then Elizabeth, uh, then Christelle, and then the host, Sarah and uh, Jensen. Um, each will have um, a presentation of 15, uh, maximum 20 minutes, and I will be strict um, to share with us all what's going on in their institute relative to digital humanities. And this all in the, the theme of this panel, uh, why does digital humanities matter? So first of all, Christelle, are you ready in Miami to share with us? Amanda. Amanda. Uh, Amanda sorry. Um, that's a funny mix up. Amanda, sorry for that. Are you ready to share with us what's going on in Miami? Definitely, yes. Let me start sharing my screen. And apologies, everyone. I have a bit of a cold. Uh, I was just in New York last week and in the travel, got a cold. So let me get my screen ready for you. One second. Margo, can you pin her so that so that she puts the, the screen? I'm not supposed to touch anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's Penelope. Can you all see this all right? Can everyone see this okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Great. So I'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you all today. My name is Amanda Moreno. I'm the okay. interim uh, Esperanza Bravo de Verona Chair of the Cuban Heritage Collection at the University of Miami Libraries. And today I'll be speaking with you about digital resources at the Cuban Heritage Collection. So to get us started, I'm going to speak a bit about the background and mission and history of the Cuban Heritage Collection. I'll speak a bit about our digital collections, uh, work we've done with our Twitter archiving project and different faculty projects that we've done with um, professors at the university. The mission of the Cuban Heritage Collection is to collect, preserve, and provide access to resources for research, teaching, and learning at the University of Miami and within the broader scholarly community, connecting people to Cuba and its diasporas past and present. Today, we're the largest collection of materials on Cuba outside of the island. 
We have close to 75,000 books and periodicals covering all subject areas and over 800 archival collections that range from literary and political papers to collections of ephemera yeah. documenting the experiences of the global Cuban diaspora. We collect rare and contemporary books, journals, artist books, and newspapers, as well as personal papers, organizational records, photographs, maps, audiovisual materials, and born digital content, like websites and social media feeds to make them available to students, faculty, and the community at large. Um, I want us to take some time to think about the why of our work. Why are archives important to society and what function do archives serve? Archives tell us stories about individuals institution, and institutions. They tie us to our identities, whether those be cultural, or whether those are cultural, ethnic, or gender-based. Um, and archives also serve a practical function of supporting scholarly, administrative, and personal research. Archival study scholars stress how archival approaches to making records available or not create filters that influence perceptions of the past, and that we must be aware of how we exercise power over memory and identity in our work. Uh, in our work at the Cuban Heritage Collection, we think about archival silences and hidden histories, so we focus on underdocumented communities and the implications of how memory is represented and transmitted over time. Whose stories are told in the archive and therefore whose history is important? As archivists, we need to think about how our collecting and descriptive decisions both privilege and marginalize various narratives about the Cuban experience because our work shapes the formation of collective memory of Cuba and its diaspora. We're cognizant that future scholars and members of our community will interpret the history and development of the island and its diaspora in part through the materials that they find at the Cuban Heritage Collection. So we often think about how our professional labor, collecting and describing, impacts how the Cuban experience will be viewed. We're trying to be more proactive in addressing gaps in our holdings and identifying opportunities for growth. So we're collecting more of the later waves of Cuban migration and focusing on collecting stories and documentation of diverse ethnic, racial, religious, gendered and LGBTQ experiences of life on the island and in the diaspora. Our digital collections consist of Spanish and English language books, periodicals and archival materials on Cuba and its diaspora that are available for public use. We have close to 100 digital collections available online, the majority of which are physical collections in our holdings that have been digitized to provide broader access or as a preservation strategy. Some of the collections that we have online are also born digital. One of our most popular digital collections is the CHC Books Collection, which features titles such as Los Ingenios, Colección de Vistas de los Principales Ingenios de Azúcar de la Isla de Cuba by Justo Herman Cantero, with illustrations by Eduardo Laplante, published in Havana in 1857. We also have a portfolio of 32 Frederick Miale lithographs uh, titled Isla de Cuba Pintoresca, published in Havana in 1839, and many books on natural history and law and the legal profession under the Cuban Law and Governance Digital Collection. The Law Collection is the largest digital collection from CHC with over 98,000 pages available online. The second largest is the CHC Periodicals Collection with over 12,200 pages and then CHC Books with 1,200 pages. Two of our most used archival digital collections are the Cuban Historical and Literary Manuscript Collection, which contains primary sources on enslavement and indenture from the 17th to the 19th century, and the Cuban Photograph Collections, which include various groupings of photographic materials that document the development of the history of photography, life in Cuba from the 19th to the 21st century, and the diaspora experience post-Cuban Revolution. Our digital collections are often used in teaching and were an especially valuable tool during the pandemic when we, when we pivoted to virtual instruction. CHC has been collecting tweets related to current events in Cuba and the diaspora since 2014. As part of the tweet archiving project, our former archivist Natalie Bauer worked with the library's web and application development team to create data visualizations related to tweets collected after President Obama announced the normalization of diplomatic relations between the US and Cuba in 2014. CHC created a research guide to provide access to visualizations on the 2014 U.S. Cuba Policy Change Twitter archive, as well as links to websites that we archive that discuss the political changes happening at the time. The Twitter data visualizations included a map of tweets by language and a sentiment analysis that shows a scatter plot of the sentiment of English language tweets. Other examples of Twitter data we've collected include the following thematic collections. Uh, that we have the 2017 Wet Foot Dry Foot Policy Change Twitter archive, the 2019 LGBTQ Conga Twitter archive, and archives related to Cuban reactions to COVID-19 and the 2020 US presidential election. We've also worked to document the activities of contemporary protest movements online through the Movimiento San Isidro Twitter archive and the 2021 Cuban anti-government protests Twitter archive. Here are some examples of tweets we collected from 2018 to 2021. Uh, from 2018 to 2019, a group of Cuban artists, journalists, and academics, including the rapper Dennis Solis and performance artist Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, featured here on the left, formed the Movimiento San Isidro to pro protest government and censorship of artistic expression, and they organized their conversations online under the hashtag La Bandera de Todos. 
In 2020, the death of Hansen Hernandez, an Afro-Cuban man at the hands of Cuban police, sparked months of peaceful protests from June to December. Protesters were critical of police brutality and racism and called for the release of political prisoners. In November, over 300 artists and intellectuals protested in front of the Cuban Ministry of Culture in Havana in response to the arrest of Venezuelis on November 27th. The group rejects repression and violence by the state, along with members of Movimiento San Isidro, and the hashtag 27N becomes popular around this conversation. In 2021, a new, in a new anti-government protest, Cubans across the island gathered in the streets chanting freedom and calling for President Miguel Diaz Canel to step down from office in July. The Cuban police responded with violence against protesters. The protests took place in the context of surging coronavirus infections, a weakened economy, shortage of basic goods, and curtailing of civil liberties. Many Cubans in the diaspora rallied in support of the protesters, with some calling for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. Attempts to protest continued throughout the year, and then surged the hashtags of La Once Jota, SOS Cuba, and Patria y Vida. Our documentation of political protests serves as a record of police violence, the descent of Cubans on the island, and the reaction of the diaspora community in the face of these events. The tweets are stored as JSON files, and you can see a, a file viewer here with the content. Um, and we make these collections of data sets available to researchers in our reading room. Moving on to some examples of collaborations with University of Miami faculty on digital humanities projects at various scales. Uh, we worked with Professor Allison Schifani from the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures on a student assignment for her Spanish class, Cinema from the Spanish Speaking World of Translation. Students used commercials and newsreel footage filmed by Cuban cinematographer Osvaldo Sanchez for an archival video remixing project. Sanchez's collection includes content from both Cuba and the US dating from the 1940s to the 1980s. The bulk of the collection includes commercials for local businesses from the 1960s to 70s, serving Miami's Latino community from restaurants to furniture and clothing stores. In the proposed assignment, students use material from the Sanchez collection to explore narrative strategies in film and video. In the scaffolded assignment, each student selected one of the commercials available in the archive and using Adobe Spark, remade the video into a work of speculative fiction. Students inserted titles, produced a soundtrack, introduced texts, and or composed voiceovers for the films, thus remixing them to expose the kinds of elements film and video makers use to tell stories and elicit audience responses. Students were trained in Adobe Spark in a two-day lab session in the library's digital scholarship lab, and then they submitted their finished remix and the class held a mini film festival to share their work with their peers. And these are some examples of the digital collection uh, of the videos from the Osvaldo Sanchez film collection. Uh, we've also used History Pen, which is a digital user-generated archive of historical photos, video videos, uh, audio recordings, and personal recollections for students to upload uh, location data uh, to pin it onto Google Maps. Um, so students were able to use archival content and kind of create a, a digital map of their neighborhood. Uh, in December 2021, we hosted a group of 35 high school students from the International Studies Charter High School in Little Havana uh, for a tour and primary source instruction session. And part of the um, learning activities that we did with them was for them to create a history pin account um, and make this collection stories from Little Havana using materials from the Cuban Heritage Collection and also special collections at the libraries. The History Pit exercise allowed the high school students to engage with the history of their neighborhood and provided a platform for discussion of gentrification and its impact on their community. Another example of a longer term collaboration is our work on the Cuban Theater Digital Archive. Uh, CHC has a strength in documentation of professional theater in Cuba and the diaspora. The Cuban Theater Digital Archive, or CTDA, was created in, tw in 2004 by UM professor Lillian Manzler in collaboration with the CHC. The archive has more than 7,000 items, including photographs, programs, stage and costume designs from the Cuban Stage Design Documentation Project in Havana, and recordings of more than 200 film theatrical productions staged in the U.S. and Cuba. As part of the project, digitization was done in Havana, and copies of the content were left with the artists and theater companies, and additional copies were brought back to Miami. In closing, digital humanities projects increase access to primary sources that can be used in innovative research. The use of digital collections in Cuban studies curriculum expands our available resources for teaching and learning, furthering CHC's mission to collect, preserve, and provide access to materials of enduring historical and research value for our community. Through our digital humanities projects, we hope to apply technology to expand capacity for knowledge making, while at the same time making Cuban heritage relevant to new and younger audiences. Thank you all so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda, and especially given uh, the calls. Uh, that was uh, fascinating and, and very rich. Um, just before we uh, uh, move on to the next speaker, which is uh, Elisabeth Pierre-Louis, I wanted to say that uh, there is a chat box, so for you to have questions, just um, 
you can put them there if you're online and for you here in the audience, there will be uh, opportunity after the presentations for Q&A. So um, I'd like now to give the floor to the online floor to Elisabeth Pierre-Louis. Um, welcome, Elisabeth. And I think it will be our Penelope who will bring up the presentation or will you do that yourself? Um, I can do it myself with chat. Just one second. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. So, well, so it's not presentation mode. Yes, it's coming. <laughs> There's a small yes. gap. I'm sorry about that. Oh, yes, so, no, that. Thank you. So thank you very much um, for inviting me and um, please bear me. I am not from a university. Um, I work in a national foundation in Haiti that was created in 95 and part of an international network of the Open Society Foundations and it stands for knowledge and, and freedom or liberty. Um, so we, what I wanted to do is just share maybe um, a few collaborative projects um, of digital collections because we did have um, a network of uh, libraries, but these were community libraries and we do support some universe, uh, many university partnership initiatives. The first digital collection concerned literature and it was um, through a platform called Litafkar, which meant lit literature from Africa and the Caribbean. And it was um, created as a network of libraries in Haiti, Rwanda, Benin, and Belgium. And uh, this platform was created not only to give an overview of what was um, the literary prizes, but also the possibility to have access to an on a digital library. We worked with the National Library of Haiti, for example, um, who agreed to give us um, novels or short stories or poetry or theater that was um, in the public domain and it was scanned and we were able to to give access to these documents but also what was very interesting for us to have two university professors who created a whole class about the emergence of um, French speaking literature in Africa and in Haiti. And um, also we had the possibility of see, to see points where these literature, um, uh, even though the history is completely different, um, how they could um, merge or, or um, the points of contacts as well. And this project was launched in 2015 and financed by the European Union through the East ACP countries. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges in uh, further, further down, um, but I'll go to another platform uh, that Margot knows pretty well, which is where we met, we met professionally, is the Association of Caribbean University Institu Institution and Research Libraries. Um, it's a... Uh, it's an association, a regional association that celebrated its 50th anniversary. And one of our, at the foundation in Haiti, it was important for us to create this uh, digital exhibit that could be also a digital archive for all the conferences, the annual events that took place, um, that this association organized throughout the, the Caribbean. So all the little dots are where there was um, annual events. And through only the title, you can see um, the richness and also the progression, I could say, of the information science libraries, museums, and archives throughout the Caribbean. Um, and so I'm sorry, I had to close my video. <laughs> the, so this is an online um, archive that is continuing. Um, we, we are 
we keep on adding content as much as we can, asking members, uh, past presidents, upcoming presidents to remember to give us their archives so that we can continue this uh, digital archive. It's not very well exported, but it's an ongoing um, collection. For some reason I cannot move. Okay. Another um, platform that we are in the process of creating is about uh, human rights education. And these are tools that were created um, since 2017 that have to do much more with um, getting young people engaged in civic education through um, different tools, um, different programs, having to do with debate, with um, children literature on themes like migration, like um, memory of the dictatorship or um, um, violence against children. So all of these different tools that were created and tested are being put in this um, human, human rights platform that is an ongoing project. Um, it's a, this one is more experimental about the use of this, uh, this uh, collection, but we, we think that in a few years, it will be something that can, can keep continuing to grow. Um, so these are project that was spearheaded at the foundation and it was different um, collection. Now I'm going to speak more about uh, did, this is a working group that was creating within the Haitian Studies Association uh, umbrella. It's the Archive and Public Memory Working Group um, created in 2021 and we had about 50 interested participants. Uh, the, this, this working group it is a generative collaborative space that will provide practical resources for archivists, library workers, and cultural heritage workers, researchers, and others to enable people in Haiti and the diaspora to be aware of and access existing archives and provide knowledge and resources to preserve, store, and catalog archival collections. Um, two of uh, the main um, initiators of this group were worked on one of the collections that I'm going to talk about in a few slides or um, also at uh, the D Digital Library of the Caribbean. But this is kind of an independent working group. It's pretty loose in, in how we are functioning, um, but we are trying to, to think about creating digital collection um, within Haiti with uh, low electricity, low internet penet uh, penetration, and also the, like, uh, the lack of human resources that can impede such projects. So this is more a shared resource working group. Um, this one is a different because it's um, within Grinnell, Grinnell College Libraries in Iowa and the Waterloo Center of the Arts. And this is uh, what would more fit, I could say, the 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 scope of the presentations that we're listening here, um, because this project concerns art history, the state of art history, and how digital humanities can be used to think about Haitian art collection and resources globally. So it um, received a national endowment of the heart um, funding, and uh, it is an ongoing project that will also work on standardizing um, methods for collecting uh, and recording and organizing um, data from important art collections in Haiti. Um, one, one resource that a lot of people know is the Digital Library of the Caribbean. And we have uh, many agreements, um, heritage libraries in Haiti. Um, most, the, mo the two most important being the Bibliothèque Haitienne de Père du Saint-Esprit, which has a, a large uh, literature collection and the Bibliothèque, la Bibliothèque des Frères de l'Instruction Chrétienne, who have a large um, newspaper, 
periodical collections, and also very old published books that date from the colonial times. Um, these libraries are grantees of Focal. We give them a kind of a, a support grant um, for the past uh, 15 plus years. But, and the digital library, Digital Library of the Caribbean also has agreement with national, the Archive National d'Haïti, the National Archives, and also the National Library, which are both under the Minister of Culture of Haiti. And these are um, government entities. So I provided a list of uh, different links at the end of my presentation, where you can see all of the content that DLOC over the years has been able to collect organize and share um, for researchers. Um, I just wanted to touch quickly on these private collections that were donated to um, important American universities. One is um, the Duke, the Radio Haiti Archives um, that um, is at Duke University. And one is the Berner, Bernard Diedrich um, Archives that is at FIU. Um, and I was able to find in the in our archives this picture of human rights activists, um, both past uh, Jean-Claude Bajeu and Bernard Diedrich in the middle with Michel Duvivier Pierre Louis, which is the founder of uh, Focal, the, the foundation where I work. Um, these are very important archives that um, have been digitized and accessible. One, for example, I know of one very important project, a documentary about a very lesser, lesser known um, uh, massacre that took place in the 1960s in the South southeast of the country, where a lot of uh, Bernardidic materials is serving for this documentary. And this is creating a lot of discussion about parts of our very near history um, that are not very well known. And these are very interesting collaborations. And I will finish with this um, new collection called Muka Ashti, and it's uh, for gender studies, and it's, uh, it's been launched in 2023. Um, this is from a partnership with the University of Quebec, and they are collecting um, many books, journal articles, book chapters, articles that have to do with gender studies. And this is one of uh, an initiative that we are very interested in following because a lot of um, these papers have not been um, accessible. They were only in paper. And so all of these references are going to be very important for different um, research materials and for researchers in the future. Um, so the question about why, I think in Haiti, what is important is these national collections have to be created, stored, and organized, um, but in a way that is also adaptable to our very specific context. Um, for example, the importance of having permission, access to digital connections, being able to have stable platforms, because one of the issues that we find, and, and that was what happened with the first uh, platform I was talking about literature, is that once um, the grant is over, it's very difficult to keep these platforms alive. And not having um, these platforms um, regularly um, updated, um, even uh, migrated to better systems, sometimes the whole of the information disappears. And this is something where you have to have human resources that know and are able to take care of these platforms. Um, and also we need to have adaptable resources for next generations and promote and use these resources in ways that they don't stay um, in a, I can say in a cloud, archival cloud, um, and that they really serve for us to better understand ourselves, our past and our future. And here are a link of different um, 
platforms that I shared. And the last one is an article about music and the accidental archivist. archivist. I thought that it was a very interesting view also about the paper collections and how sometimes um, it can be just the people who love classical music and who are aware of uh, um, treasures that are that can disappear very quickly. And this is the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't go too long and, uh, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pierre-Louis. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions, even though it was uh, very insightful and clear. Uh, but like I said, we will just continue with the presentations and. Um, I now give the floor to uh, Gisel Cosino Diaz of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies here in New York to share with us what's going on in your institute. Great, thank you so much. Um, so it's gonna be shared there, okay. Um, great, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm Cristel Cosino Diaz and I'm Centro's Director of Research Programs and Public Humanities. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, one, the more established side or like the presence that most people might be familiar with in terms of um, Centro's digital collections, which would be the Centro archives, um, but also about um, a lot of the really new work that we're doing. So um, before I came on board at Centro, Centro did not have a public and digital humanities initiative. A lot of this work really was concentrated um, in the archive where there's been um, a lot of effort in terms of digitization. Um, um, over the last few years, uh, but in the area of digital humanities and public humanities, it's really been a little bit over a year um, since we've really uh, started devoting time to building up new initiatives. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is in the planning stages or is sort of going to be um, start being made public over the next year or so, but I think um, it's great to sort of give you a little preview of what's coming up. If you want to move to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so I want to start with the Centro Archives. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies um, has basically the uh, largest repository of um, materials about Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans in the United States, in the United States, right? Um, and in our digital collections, you can find access to photographs, documents, artifacts, arts, maps, oral histories, moving image, audio clips, and other digitized or born digital materials pertaining to um, stateside Puerto, Ric Puerto Ricans. Um, we're located at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College, and our archivists and librarians are always very excited um, to work with researchers and are also um, fielding a lot of um, requests for um, digital materials um, in case you can't make it um, to our archive, right? Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about what is um, coming up. Again, we already have a really um, substantial um, digital collection, um, but over the last few years, thanks to um, a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, we've been working on digitizing much more of those collections and making them available to the public um, with a project titled 100 Years of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture in New York City. Um, the fruit of this work is actually about to start becoming public um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, the, um, the digital collections page is being redone and is going to debut within, I think, the next month or so. Um, and we have some really exciting materials that are going to be um, coming up in that, um, including um, multiple drafts of Pura Belpres folklore stories, including editor notes, right? I mean, right now, if you go on the website, there are some photos of Pura, there are some photos of the manuscripts out here, like, folks are really going to get access to um, a lot more of, of, of really seeing what her process was like, right? Um, we will be uploading hundreds of photos from the Chadas collection. And the Chadas collection is one of my favorite um, collections in the Centro Archives. The photo here is um, one from there. And Chadas is a grassroots organization in that was the, based in Loisaida um, that operated from the 1980s to the early 2000s as a cultural center and a home for um, other small nonprofits. Um, 
There's a lot of really great photos from their programs and initiatives, um, including they had a geocentric dome project um, that wasn't in Loisaida, but was um, upstate. Um, and it's, it's really amazing to see all of the projects um, that this community group um, put together. And this is finally going to be available online in the next couple of weeks. So we're really excited um, for folks to be able to see um, what's in the Chara's um, archive and also the Yelva Cabrera papers. Elba Cabrera is a photographer who has documented the Puerto Rican art scene. Um, just, uh, I think, last week or two weeks ago, Centro participated in the centennial celebration for Tito Puente, and a lot of the images shown at this event were from the Elba Cabrera papers. Um, so all of this is going to be um, unveiled in the next couple of weeks. Um, we're also working on Born Digital Archival projects. Um, our archivist, Lindsay Whitwer, has um, talked me through um, their current process, which uh, right now is focusing on floppy disks. And we'll be really starting to document the central records, which is so it's one of the most important things I think you know, we have, right, especially as somebody who just recently came to Centro working with the archives and seeing what other people have been doing before at Centro has been really important to me. So this is, um, it's going to be an important part of the process, but it also shows, in, and I, I can't give you exact dates yet, but it is um, forthcoming. We are going to be doing in the fall some community archiving workshops, and this is um, to be able to bring organizations and people in the community who are interested in learning how to preserve their documents. Um, and our archivist and library team will be leading um, these workshops in the fall. Um, I will mention um, this a couple of times, but all of this work is being made possible um, by uh, the Centro's Upper Manhattan Creative and Learning Hub, which is funded by um, Representative Adriano Espaillat and Senators uh, Charles Schumer and Kristen Gillibrand with a very generous earmark that is really um, helping us build up programming like this. Um, at, uh, based out of the, the uh, Central Library and Archives at the Silverman School of Social Work. Um, so in terms of the archives, I think we have a lot of really great um, things that are going to be made available. And if we can move to the slide, we can talk a little bit about what I see in my role, right? Um, a lot of this digitization work is being already done by the archive. I'm here to um, think of other ways that we can make this a um, visible to the public, right? And get the public to engage with it more outside of just the archival setting. Um, so we, um, I bring in folks to play around with the archive and to also think about other um, public humanities initiatives at Centro. So I'll tell you a little bit more about those. So more on the public humanity sides, we have the Bridging the Divide study group. Um, and this is uh, really has been, is what's been taking up most of my time over the last year. And it's a Mellon funded initiative to put together interdisciplinary study groups um, out of Centro. Um, Centro has a long history of task forces from its founding in the seventies where folks from different um, disciplines and areas would come together to discuss topics such as art and culture, education, um, prisons, and many others. And again, one thing that's really cool is that if you go to the archives, you can look at all the notes from these task forces in the past, right? Um, so to try and build on that tradition, um, we put together, um, right now we're in the middle of the first study group, which is focused on decolonization. Um, and it's brought together six um, scholars from a number of different disciplines, um, two journalists and four um, artists or and or cultural workers. Um, and I think to me, this is also an exercise in digital humanities because they're all over the place, right? So we've had to think about ways that we can bring um, different publics and different um, people doing different types of work um, and how to build a big project or build a community throughout um, an extended period because each study group is going to be um, a year long, right? Um, the second study group, the application process is open now and the theme is gonna be post-disaster futures. And the idea for these is going to be that, um, each group, we will have a digital hub that will collect materials that um, all of the study group members have been working on through the past year, and also white papers written by the study group co-conveners um, that will be giving policy recommendations regarding, in this case, decolonization for the first group, post-disaster futures for the second group. Um, so we're also thinking about you know creative ways to put the work of all these very different people together online and make it available to the public. Um, 
I put the flyer because that's next week and I'm so excited and I hope um, other folks can come and that you can spread the word. Um, we put together uh, the Thinking with Bad Bunny Symposium. Um, we have two full days, a really, really wonderful lineup. Um, all of it is going to be live streamed and we hope that this will have a digital home as well. Um, Again, it's going to be, I'm, I'm very, very excited. I think it's going to be really fun. And I think sort of going back again, it's, we're trying to create hubs where people of different backgrounds can come together. It's not just academic, it's journalists, it's educators. It's, you know, I think the panel I'm looking forward to the most has like classically trained musicians coming to talk about um, Bad Bunny and reggaeton and how they see it, right? And sort of countering that narrative that reggaeton and then both like isn't real music, right? Um, so hopefully <laughs> once we're done, oh, okay, God, sorry, I thought oh, it was that. Photo, photo. Okay, almost there, almost there. Um, so if we can click on the Centro at 50 link, um, sorry, very quickly. Um, so Centro is celebrating its 50th anniversary um, this year, and I don't know if I'll be able to <laughs> open, um, but thinking also about um, projects where, I can just talk about it, if you can scroll down a little bit. Um, Wait, no, up, 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 up. I'm not seeing it. Look. It's all right. I can I can just talk you through it. Um, we've built an interactive timeline using archival materials using the platform Night Labs, um, which was a really um fun experience. Um, sort of playing around with, you know, it's open source um materials, right? That really lets us uh, bring the archival materials um to life and it's sort of chronicling the 50 years of Centro history um, and we can incorporate incorporate videos, um, photography, um, we're looking for ways to incorporate sound as well. But again, it's, it's a way for folks that are interested in learning more about Centro to have an interactive um, way to engage with, um, with our history and with our materials and sort of serve it as an introduction for the archive. Um, the Diasporican Arts in Motion project um, is headed by Centro's Arts and Culture Initiative. Um, and that is, I think, yeah, that, that doesn't have anything interactive so far, but it's meant to be a repository and digital archive featuring um, Puerto Rican artists. It's mostly visual artists now um, working in the diaspora. And we are gonna have artist profiles. Each artist profile is going to have um, digitized works. It's going to have, um, uh, you know, just sort of like a starting point into bibliographies. And in a further phase of the project, um, we would like to do a community thick mapping project um, where folks can explore a lot of the content of the Diasporican Arts in Motion project in um, a map form, right? So we can see where each artist is located, where museums that are exhibiting or have Puerto Rican art in their collections or Diasporican art in their collections um, will be highlighted. Um, and then just one more thing, which is the projects that we have coming up in digital humanities um, at Centro is, if that would be the next slide, please. Um, so another thing is sort of bringing in other folks in our community that wanna um, engage or that wanna create projects using Centro's materials um, or using Centro's work. The first one, I think, which will launch actually in the next couple of months is a project I've been working on with our research associate, Dr. Seliani Rivera Velasquez. Um, and she's putting together um, which is called Chronología Queer, Brevísima Historiografía del Quehacer Activista, Mediático y Cultural LGBTQIA+, y Queer en República Dominicana y Puerto Rico. And she's also using the Night Labs platform, and it's very cool because it's we're working on sort of creating intersecting timelines that allow us to see, you know, sort of understand the history of queer movements in Puerto Rico and in the Dominican Republic side by side. Um, and then with the Pedro Pietri remix, we're working with a professor at Baruch um, to bring in writers and artists who want to do work with the Pedro Pietri um, archives, which is probably one of the, you know, the collections that's most visited at the Centro Archives. And the idea is one, to create a sort of a workshop space for these artists and writers to come work with the archive. But then in the future, and this would probably be um, next year, within the next few years, is to have um, a digital um, or like a website that brings together not just um, digitized materials, but also new work created by these scholars and writers inspired by the work in the archive. Um, happy to take any questions and thank you so much. 
confusion a little bit. And I, 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 I needed to sort of signal, you know, yeah, we are absolutely. a bit ahead of schedule, but it's also super interesting. And also, we started with this panel because everything that's presented here is such rich, you know, uh, uh, material to discuss further on. So thank you very much for sharing all that. Uh, I never expected to be hearing about floppy disks and then done <laughs> today. But <laughs> thank you. Um, last but not least, uh, the host institute, the BSI, Sarah and Jensen. Can you share with us what's going on here? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the intersection of Dominican studies and digital humanities. Um, from in-house projects to open source, that was Jensen's idea for the title. And I like it a lot because it represents a lot of what we have been doing uh, since uh, we began digitizing our collections and making them available. Okay. So many of you know who we are, but uh, briefly, we began in 19, I'm a librarian, I don't speak so loud. Okay. Yeah, I need to, yeah, let me let me try to, to be better, yeah, okay. So the Institute was founded in 1992 um, as a call from the community. Uh, the Dominican educators, a council of Dominican educators got together and they understood the importance of creating a, a place for research on Dominican studies. Uh, to begin um, unpacking all these stereotypes that were um, there and still exist, but we're trying to make that go away uh, as much as we can do. And one of the founding directors, uh, members of the Institute uh, was Anthony Stevens Acevedo, who is right here today. So uh, we have three main components. Uh, one of them is the uh, research area, which is on the fourth floor. Perhaps some of you went upstairs thinking that you were uh, here and um, the library and the archives. Uh, we share the resources. And what we do a lot with the groups that come and visit us is that we ask them that question. Do you know the difference between archives and library? And how do, we, do they intersect? And, and it's a fun way of, of teaching people how to work with both for their research papers and, and research projects. So uh, digital humanities, you know, the last couple of years has really been a central point for us in advancing Dominican studies and a lot of the research projects we've developed over the years. It really has allowed us to present a lot of the materials in the archives in the library and also enhance the research projects we, we have done. It also has supported and helped promote us develop digital archives and also a lot of the public facing exhibitions we have done uh, to provide wider access and also reach a lot of different audiences with the work we've done. Um, so we have we selected some digital archives projects because we have plenty of them, uh, but we wanted to highlight some. And the two ones that we have here, again, Anthony Sinsatecedo was the mastermind of this. And we have um, our Dr. Lisa Acosta Cornel, who was part of that project as well, the first Blacks in the Americas. And she's going to be talking about that later on. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot about it now, but the Spanish paleography tool, uh, which is a, a tool that um, Anthony and a group of us uh, help him uh, create and, and make available. Uh, you go to that side and you learn how to read this 16th Ooh. century and the 17th century um, uh, archival sources. And the idea behind this uh, was to democratize knowledge. And, and Anthony also talked about a lot about that, democratized knowledge, making uh, this information available to high school students and to people from the community, not only PhD students or uh, professors and distinguished professors, but everyone. And that's the purpose of this open source. And it was a grant, a, a small grant that we got from the NEH. And we created this uh, for the use of everybody. So please use that uh, this uh, tool and then also share it with others. The First Blacks in the Americas is a, one of our most exciting projects and is uh, called completely bilingual. Los primeros negros en las Americas, word by word. We, we worked uh, together uh, of putting this, um, making this available also from for uh, Dominican scholars in the Dominican Republic so they can have access to this information. And again, the notion of Dominicans are, oh, all Dominicans are anti-Black or we don't like to be called Blacks, et cetera. This is a way of saying, uh, okay, go back to your history and understand who we really are. And from day one, we had this interaction between the Taino uh, community and the uh, Spaniards and the Europeans and the Africans. 
African communities. So this website has 71 packages of documents uh, available for you. It has different topics uh, from women all the way up to resistance. And um, the beauty about this is that if you have a question uh, or any comment or, or concern, you can communicate with us. And we can uh, also put in contact with Anthony, even though he's retired, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> we all usually send students to him, but also uh, Dr. Liste Acosta, they're experts on this topic, right? So these are two of our more, uh, more recent uh, digital projects that uh, were released by the Institute. The first one is the history of Dominican music in 2020, which deals with the development of Dominican music in the US from 1910 to 2010. And it really features a lot of interactive multimedia resources that we were able to incorporate into the project, like audio and video recordings of performances, interviews, and historical accounts related to Dominican music in the US. There's a digital archive that was constructed as well that features sheet music, photographs, and concert programs and other documents related to Dominican music in the US. I was one of the researchers of this project uh, when it started in 2016. Uh, under the leadership of uh, Ramon Hernandez, who really assigned us to the task of creating a historical timeline uh, to try to better understand how Dominican music developed in the U.S. And one of the things that we uncovered was that Dominicans were involved in a lot of genres outside of merengue and bachata. Uh, there was a lot of uh, Dominicans involved in the salsa scene and a lot of Dominicans recorded classical music and also recording a lot of different Afro-Cuban rhythms as well, such as Mambo and Cha Cha Cha. And so we were able to incorporate their contributions to those genres, but also document where Dominican music was played throughout the US, and primarily in New York City, but it was really a first attempt to try to better understand the history. Uh, the other project that we're featuring here is the Dominican Historical Neighborhoods Project, which is uh, provides a, an interactive map to show the contributions and evolution of the Dominican community. In Washington Heights. It also allows users to visualize a lot of the data and information in the context of space and place, which can be particularly useful for understanding the, the historical and cultural phenomena that took place there with Dominicans surviving as early as the late 19th century and all the way up to the 21st century. I mean, both these projects really help us facilitate collaboration between researchers and community members, and this could be particularly useful in the digital humanities where community-based research and engagement are often key components of these projects. And before we move on, I need to mention that we have here Professor Nelson Santana. Uh, he's hiding behind that uh, boiler. <laughs> he was one of the uh, also uh, researchers when we began the timeline of Dominican music and uh, he worked with us for many years. So thank you, Nelson. Many of the projects that you see there, he also was part of that. I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> So uh, CUNY Academic Work is another platform that we use to try to provide scholars and also the community access to the work that's being produced here at the Institute. Uh, it really helps us make our work available online and also open access, which is something that uh, Professor Aponte has prioritized here at the library. It also, it also helps us increase the impact of scholarship that's produced here at the Institute by making it available to a wider audience. Uh, the platform also helps support uh, having access to these works uh, that's uh, available to the public without uh, any barriers such as paywalls and other subscription fees for us, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the idea behind this is um, that we can have open access. I believe, we believe a lot in open access. We want everybody to have access to our collections, we, even though we love people to come here and use the resources here. But at the same time, we also want to make available this to the world. And the way it began was um, in-house collection or in-house exhibits. The, the ones that you see around, this is one of those exhibits. And uh, the, when the exhibit came down, then the posters were behind and no one else had access to, else had access to this. So we began thinking about a way of making this available. Um, and, the city college libraries uh, that have a digital scholarship services uh, like section and uh, uh, Dr. Shin Jong Chen um, is the uh, professor dealing with that. And when she came back from one meeting from CUNY, she said, oh, we are doing um, a, an agreement with Chair Shelf, which is part of our store. And we, we need projects. She didn't even say projects. <laughs> and I was like, yes, we have projects. So we began um, with uh, the the first one with with 
with this one, the one that you see around the 16th century La Española, they, that was the, the, the first project that we did. Uh, and then it, began, it became the first plaques in the Americas. So uh, in-house project, then our store, then our store, you know that you have to pay for that. But we made sure that we were working with the share sale part of it, which is an, an open source. And what happens is that JSTOR just bought uh, our store, but they kept that open source, which is JSTOR Forum. And this is where we belong. We don't want to be in, in, in behind like a paywall. No, we want to make this available to the world, but we also wanted to be inserted in a platform, in a database that was used throughout the world and had visibility. So that was the way we, we began doing this. And also with the digital scholarship services and, and Xinjiang's team, Hiroko that is now there with us, uh, we are developing Omega sites. Why? Because the JSTOR forum is still working with, it, it doesn't allow uh, yet videos, uh, oral history like that. So that's why we, we began creating Omega sites. So we can do all this, like an exhibit, this exhibit, but online. I gave you a little bit behind the scene <laughs> how we make this happen. Um, so the other uh, one is many of the collections that we put together. The um, JSTOR forum, they have a, a uh, landing page for, for City College and City College has from the um, archives and but also from the Dominican Institute. So if you go to the landing page, oh, um, we have Sydney here, Sydney Van, Van Nord. Yeah, yeah. She, she's the archivist and she was the other person also who worked with uh, Jin Jong. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So uh, we are together in that landing page and um, there you can see many of the projects. We have a Monocore, which is an exhibit that we put together based on Doris Rodriguez's uh, artwork. Um, on the pandemic, during the pandemic. And uh, we have uh, beautiful photos of doctors, of, of people in the, um, the first responders really during that time. Then we have also the El Musico y el Pintor, two great collections that we have here from Tito Canepa, an artist, a, a painter, and uh, Petito Guzman, a musician. And we have also a project with Dominican artists. We need to talk and stay. We need to make this happen <laughs> together, <laughs> claro, because we have a project that began uh, a while back uh, with Dominican artists, um, like, like that kind of their type of work, a little biography, mm -hmm. and we want to put videos there. So we, we need to talk mm -hmm. about this. And then uh, many other uh, projects in there, right? So uh, one of our more recent digital collaborations has been uh, also, really, our work in general here in the library and the archives has been sort of our transition from traditional modes of archival practice to collaborating with CUNY faculty. So Dr. Ryan Mann Hamilton was uh, an anthropologist and professor at LaGuardia Community College. He reached out to us in 2019 to help him uh, sort of do some archival work in Samana. Uh, he uncovered some documents that needed to be uh, preserved and, and treated. And so Sofia Monegro, uh, our research associate here at Community mm -hmm. SI, accompanied me and Ryan to do this work for a week in July in 2019. And really what uh, uncovered, sort of what unfolded was this process that you see here of us digitizing these uh, manuscripts of birth, marriage, and baptismal records from the Mother Bethel AME Church and also the St. Peter's Evangelical Church, which was where all these documents were being stored in Samana that Ryan uncovered. And so uh, the documents range from 1909 to 1970. Uh, all of these documents are now available on JSO Forum. We created a digital archive that's available there for researchers to have access to these documents. The great thing about this project was that the community was involved and they're still heavily involved. Sophia has continued the work in Samana, preserving these documents, which stay there. We don't bring the documents here, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, really important for us to uh, acknowledge that we needed to preserve these documents, but we also wanted them to be a part of the process. And so for us, uh, having this sort of new uh, way of working uh, has really helped us better understand how we could be a service to the community, not the other way around. We even bought with a friend, we got a grant from Salon, um, small went and we even uh, bought a uh, scanners and we left the scanners back there and also we bought archival boxes and we uh, the collect they they put the collection together and and left that uh, in an organized way so people from the community can go and and look for their papers but also for the digital uh, collections 
Yeah, it's an amazing project. And we're looking for volunteers <laughs> if you want to be part of it. Okay, so how we, we, we know about these digital collections and all that, but we love people to use this, right? It's not just to be uh, on, on, the, on the cloud. We work with educators. We work with faculty members in facilitating access to these collections. We do educational workshops. We invite uh, sixth graders all the way up to high school students and also um, people from the community as well. Uh, and of course, uh, City College students, graduate, undergraduate, you name them, but the educators, it's important for us that uh, educators, that teachers come here and they see what we have. And then when they teach about the history of New York City, they can include Juan Rodriguez, the first um, immigrant that happened to be the, from the Dominican Republic, a black man in 1613. And they, when they talk about, for example, uh, Ellis Island, they can include the 5,000 plus Dominicans who came to Ellis Island that we know about. And then when they talk about um, the uh, veterans, mm -hmm. for example, the, the World War Second, the World War II veterans, they include Dominicans because we even have a, a uh, Afro-Dominican man as a Tuskegee Airman. So all of this is important, and they these kids can see themselves as well in in those documents, in the books, and and, and this our future. And also we want them here because we show them the library and the archives, and we show them City College and. You can come here or you can go to another university. It's a, a very subtle way of telling them that we want them to continue in, in this, uh, like uh, educating themselves. So yeah, that's our mission. That's what we do. Gracias, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Pues yo creo que ahora sí las preguntas. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um... How are you all doing here? Is it interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't see questions from uh, online, but is, are there questions online? No, not yet. Uh, it's so wonderful. You know, why does this all matter? Uh, we've heard about um, collective memory. We've heard about uh, the next generation, about bridging divides, um, democratization of, of knowledge. There's so much in the why, there's so much behind digitizing as if that's sort of the new making copies. Uh, there's so much more about it. Um, if there are no questions online, any one of you have questions for the panel? Yes, please. All right. So we definitively live in a streaming age. I was with a friend yesterday who had his grandchildren there and he said they get everything from a screen now. So as a general question to all of the archivists, I would be very interested in hearing about what challenges you have in terms of archiving the moving image. Hmm. Anyone? Anybody. Yeah. Or online? That's why we need you, Professor Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Let's <laughs> first look online if Amanda or Elizabeth. I'm happy to answer. Um, I think a big issue we face is resources and the availability of players for legacy media. Uh, that's something that we're thinking a lot about and we're looking for grant opportunities to digitize content to make it more accessible. Um, we are still collecting a lot of legacy formats um, and making them available to researchers, but kind of on an ad hoc basis at this point, uh, where we outsource the digitization. But we're hoping to build capacity internally to be able to make that content accessible because the, the visual record is so important uh, for researchers to be able to have access to. Thank you. Yes. We also got a small grant from Metro that uh, our Barry is there. She's part of the uh, advisors in, in there. And um, we're going to be digitizing our lectures from 1992 when we began the Institute to 2000. So that's part of the moving images and, and, and like the history of the Institute. You are going to be in one of those videos. Claro que si. <laughs> you have been part of- of so uh, uh, Claro que si, yes, yes. So it, There's it's a lot of boomeranging going on in digital humanities. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm not an archivist, although I am a little bit familiar, more familiar with um, a lot of the processes, I think. Um, so Centro has a lot of um, video and audio cassette materials. Um, 
that it is it is harder to start processing. I think the question of funding, as everybody mentions, is really um, the biggest hurdle. I think especially for us, there's also the question of rights. Um, and working with the artists and with the families um, because agreements that have been made before don't necessarily account for the mm -hmm. audiovisual for streaming. Mm -hmm. um, so that is another challenge that is was unexpected, um, but we're working our way um, through it, especially because you know, it is, it's, it's very urgent. We have, for example, the Pedro Pietri materials, um, you know, it's, it's a ticking clock, right? Especially with magnetic materials that they degrade. So there, it's not like we can just sort of like hold off on these um, projects forever, right? Waiting for the right funder, waiting for all the rights issues to resolve themselves. Um, so it's, it's challenging, but I think that that's definitely sort of where, um, where our, we're, we're sort of at on that, yeah. And online, uh, Dr. Pierre-Louis? Anything to add to that? I think that the copy, copyright issues are, is one of the, the main problem because throughout, for example, in the Caribbean, throughout each country, you have specific laws and sometimes an absence of specific um, laws, laws concerning archival materials, um, images of the people, the age of the people who are on the images. And these things vary a lot from one island to another, from one country to another. So these are um, future discussions that I think are very fruitful to move forward. Yes, thank you all. And thank you, uh, Professor, for the question. There is a comment, not so much a question, but I want to share it uh, from Emma Dederik uh, from the Latin American Music Center, Museum Center. Uh, wonderful presentations and projects from all. Thanks for sharing. Oh. <laughs> uh, I think we have... Yeah, room for one more question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I thought it was really interesting because we framed this as uh, an event uh, with a question mark, a transnational future. And, and we've heard four presentations that are still uh, nation based in a way. Um, even though you all talked about the diasporic and you included this, the diasporic experience in your presentation. So that somehow responds to the transnational question. But I was wondering if maybe you have examples that come up that come up um, of someone who would try to to maybe write uh, about a Caribbean or a regional experience and could use your materials in a different perspective. So I don't mean this as a trick question. No, I can I can start. Um, so um, we have a research associates program at Centro where we have um, you know researchers that have two to three years to work on projects. One of them um, that I highlighted in the presentation is somebody who is. Um, she's writing a book about um, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and queer history there. So, and I think like the, having the space in like the center archives, but also being in New York City, it has been like a really like fruitful um, experience for her. Another project that we have in the works um, that I didn't really have time to mention is again with one of our research associates um, who does work on the Philippines and mm -hmm. on Puerto Rico, especially focused on 19th century. Um, and one thing, um, that we are working on is on a project commemorating the 125th anniversary of 1898 um, that is bringing together scholars and artists from Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, um, Guam, um, to really think about the afterlives of empire. And in terms of the materials that he's been able to take advantage of, I think like periodicals um, from the late 19th century have been really interesting. So I was like, how were they talking about the Philippines in Puerto Rico in 1898, right? Um, and we're hoping um, it's a, a very large complicated project because we are in collaboration with folks in the Philippines, um, in Germany, in the UK, um, basically a lot of people from um, doing regional studies in these in from these different countries, and the idea would be to hopefully get an online repository for all the um, 125th anniversary commemorations. From um, it's, I think very there's a very um, it's very intentional that Spain is sort of being kept to the margins of the conversation, right? Like we really want to center um, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Philippines, and Guam. Yeah, wonderful. Any of the ladies online who want to comment? Jump in this. 
Uh, Elizabeth, yeah. You are muted. And now you can speak. <laughs> <laughs> yes. One very interesting project that I came through was with the Grinnell College. They did um, experiment with their using their digital collection, but also an artist in residence called uh, Edouard Duval Carrier, who lives in Miami. <laughs> and it was called Visual Visualizing Abolition and Freedom. I'll put the link also in the chat. And this was a collaborative work with students, artists, and himself using archival um, content also to create art but that had to do with slavery and and remembering and uh, and uh, and memory and freedom and and these are um, these artifacts are, are visible at the at the Grinnell um, College. But I think that these are very um, striking examples of how students in 2020s are thinking about freedom and liberty using artifacts that came from the, the 17th, 18th century. So this is one example. The other one I, I briefly talked about, about transnational is uh, the documentary project um, that took place in the 1960s. So it's a Haitian filmmaker um, who's doing this project and who had access to the Bernard Diedrich. Bernard Diedrich is a, is a adopted Haitian, I could say, but he actually, I think is from New Zealand and arrived in Haiti in the 1950s and created the Haitian Sun. And all these papers are at FIU. And she had, she was able to access it. And she found extremely interesting information and papers about Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And all of the solidarity that was existing between groups in Haiti and in the Dominican Republic in the early 1960s and the, in the general context also that was shifting in these two countries, um, explaining a lot of um, guerrilla groups that were happening in Haiti. So these are very interesting novel ways of using um, these digital collections and having them accessible to the public, I think in a transnational way as well. Okay. We we do have some uh, questions popping up now in the chat, uh, though it's past uh, our closing time. Uh, Amanda, did you want to share something, or can I move to the, the the chat now? No, please move to the chat. That's okay. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, here again, uh, congratulations, Rosalia uh, uh, Reyes. To all the presenters for the great effort they put into documenting and connecting these important connections with different audiences and the community at large. Um, our question is, what are the topics that most attract young people who visit your uh, archives? And I can you just in one sentence, <laughs> uh, you are working with young people. Yes, I don't yeah. know if yeah, we are. Oh, we both are oh, working with. Yeah. I just so sure. give this question to DSI and then move to the next question because of uh, the time. Oh. Yeah. What? So we're we're currently working with two uh, young uh, um, young undergraduates at Western University who are putting together this event on Afro-Dominican women, and so they've been looking at some of our materials here in the library at conferences that were held uh, on Afro-Dominican femin well, feminism, but in different parts of the Caribbean and also in Latin America. And so uh, that's um, another way of us, you know, sort of mm -hmm. engaging with topic-based yeah, topic yeah. with students. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, thank you. And then Jane Landers, I think many of you know her, she says, thank you all for the introduction to your very interesting collections. I have worked with BCRI and hope to someday get to Haiti to work there. Um, we will discuss growing places in the next uh, 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 panel. Uh, given your interest in preservation of endangered archives in Samana, you might be interested to work in our work at the Slave Society's digital um, archives. And now something pops up. So, yeah, here we are again. The Slave Society's digital archives, slavesocieties.org, uh, that holds the oldest records for Africans and indigenous. Um, people in Cuba and Spanish Florida. Uh, I'm looking at the people from the Black uh, 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 Archives in Samana. I 
Are you familiar with that? You say, uh, but we are here, we're open. This is, this is what we did this as well. So we that. can have um, collaborations and we can work together, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Yes, it's all very helpful. <laughs> For now, um, we're continuing uh, in 10 minutes from now with the next panel. So we have 10 minutes. Uh, to stretch our arms and legs at home also, please. <laughs> Stand up, move a little. I know you've been just concentrating on us. Uh, get some coffee, hug your hot dogs, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, we're all ready to continue. Do you want to say that? Do you want to switch? Are you going to the shield? Like 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 the So we're discussing hey. transnationality here, and some of you may wonder why. And now if I look at us, me being Dutch, they being Dominican, you know, imagine our flags. And what do you see? Red, white, and blue. I feel so at home. <laughs> and, and yeah, I have a little green, but that's because of my second name, which no one can pronounce. It's Groenewoud, which means Greenwood. So there's always this special connection to being green, not just in the Muppets. Uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for continuing this conversation with us. Uh, we have here, and now I need to. Oh no, you're the moderator. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm Jensen. I'm going to be moderating the second session titled uh, Digital Humanities in Caribbean Studies as part of User Perspective. Uh, before we begin, I would like to quickly introduce our speakers. First, we have Dr. Margot Gonawal from the University of Curaçao, who's the current, the first full vice scholar in residence in the Human Dominican Studies Institute, followed by Dr. Vanessa K. Vardez, Associate Provost for Community Engagement at the City College of New York, followed by Dr. Lisetta Costa Coniel, Assistant Professor in Race and Ethnic Studies at the Borough Manhattan College of Human. So, thank you, Dr. Gonawal. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I'm recovering. I'm <laughs> okay, uh, before we have this conversation, I just want to briefly put some thoughts here in the room and with uh, the uh, esteemed speakers today. We will have a conversation. Um, so we now shift from the librarians and archivists to the users, the scholars who use or work with digital humanities in whatever way. And as introduction, do I need to do this myself, Penelope? You're ready? I'm ready to, can we have the second slide? Um, there are two articles that I've been circulating for a while with people, you know, with whom we are working on digital humanities um, that may help getting started in this conversation. And one is by Lara Putnam, um, who wrote this article, The Transnational and the Text Searchable, which was published in 2016. And then um, an article I wrote myself on digital humanity, social justice, and the pluricultural realities of Dutch Caribbean heritage archives, which um, has a more practical analysis of what's going on and how that may uh, help in, you know, thinking about uh, DH. Now, if I can have the louder, yes, the second slide. Um, and um, I all, in, yeah, of course, invite you to read the full article, but for this conversation, you don't. It's just a few things I wanted to share. What Lara Putnam, and I may not do her justice, of course, I'm just summarizing, but what she says, if you look at Caribbean studies, then you see that there is this sort of parallel sort of coincidence, is it coincidence or not, that when digitization started, also scholars made that move towards a more transnational approach of their scholarship. 
Um, and it's easy to explain because when you are, like for instance myself, living on a very small island, the, you cannot just take a plane and go places. Uh, you're happy enough to go one place to get some funding. You do work on, the, for instance, Dominican Republic, you get some funds, you go to the Dominican Republic and that's your subject and then you go home again. But it's so easy to, when you find something and you think, hmm, oh wait, there is a connection with Haiti or there's a connection with uh, Puerto Rico. It's, it's more easy now to make these little jumps online. And, um, uh, but then as uh, Christelle said this morning, um, we are happy to digitize if you are, you cannot make it to visit us. That's what you said. Um, and Sarah, of course, but we all know Sarah, she keeps saying, we want you here. <laughs> um, so the, the thing that, that this article discusses is, okay, what did we win? It's quite obvious, you know, it's more efficient, more effective, less money, quicker to have the sources, big win. Um, but on the other hand, maybe there are also things that we lose by this new digitized way of, of doing your research in that context. Um, so she poses a lot of questions on what now, how, what's the balance here? So this is the first thing that I just want to share um, with you all. And the second is um, on my, uh, based on my own research, uh, Caribbean realities. Um, and I was so happy that that was brought up by Sarah as well. It's democrat democratization of knowledge. Um, and more general of culture as well. That was a, a UNESCO statement made in 1972, which really uh, started thinking about decolonizing knowledge, et cetera. Uh, then there is a work I think most of you are familiar uh, with, um, most often quoted when we discuss silences in the archives, overcoming uh, all these gaps. Um, how do you uh, treat that? Um, Caribbean heritage very often is pluricultural and mil multilingual. So even if you have this one national sort of gaze, you still are confronted with all these little segmented. And I, I come from a very small island, Curacao, and on that small island, I, you cannot count the amount of bubbles culturally and ethnically. So how do you deal with that as well? Um, so from that introduction from that overview, I looked at the, the and I was very happy to use both uh, the archipel, which I never know how to pronounce. Archipelago. Thank you so much. <laughs> Online uh, articles, reviews of digital mm -hmm. humanities projects and the Dig Digital Library, Library of the Caribbean. And I analyzed these to see how are Caribbean institutes uh, and by that, I mean both institutes um, in the Caribbean and those like here uh, working uh, with the Caribbean, about the Caribbean. Uh, how do they, they approach this? And then, uh, like we saw in the, in the previous panel, you see there is not just a single best practice. There's not just one um, perfect roadmap. This is how you do it. What you do see are uh, in these realities that there is very often a choice made either to go big, to think big, to like the, the Radio Haiti uh, project that uh, Elizabeth was presenting with Duke University, where you say, this is, mm. if we want to do this right, we need resources, we need uh, knowledge uh, on a large scale. So you, you, you think big and um, the other way is, and for instance, there's this wonderful project. Uh, I think that Alex will refer to that as well. Um, in uh, Dominica, not to, not Dominican Republic, you have wonderful projects too, but in Dominica, um, Schuyler Esprit working mm -hmm. very much community-based um, on, uh, on digital platforms and digital work. So these are sort of snippets of uh, thoughts and what's going on. I wanted to um, use as introduction and I'm not supposed to touch anything. Um, <laughs> but from here, 
we'll uh, start our discussion. Penelope, can I see if there was another slide? Yeah, let's talk. But we have a moderator, so I don't need to no, introduce. Yeah, <laughs> you see, I have this, yeah, this urge um, to be, you know, specific. So, um, who would like to go first? I know you said you have a presentation, or well, yeah, the way we worked is that um, it would be wonderful if you would start by introducing yourself and uh, sharing with us. Uh, what your scholarship is about um, and um, how that relates to digital humanities and to the things that that we now discuss and who, who uh, <laughs> good morning it's still morning thank you for the invitation i'm very happy to be here always very happy to come to the cuny dominican studies institute Aquí a todo el mundo. <laughs> therefore thank you I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic and Race Studies at the Bar of Mahana Community College. I was a postdoctoral fellow here at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, escalated because I was first a research assistant and research associate. And my, my work focuses on slavery, gender, and resistance, specifically in colonial Santo Domingo. And the the digital part emerged from the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute with my focus on gender, looking at the first Spanish women who arrived to Hispaniola. We then also looked at the black women and, and that became my involvement here in my focus here at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute led by Professor Anthony Stevens Acevedo who, who has a passion for documenting Dominican history the right way, in an inclusive way, where we go all the way back to the beginning. And therefore, my research expanded to, to look at free and enslaved Black women in Santo Domingo. And as a result of that, we produce the glimpses to um, Española, which you see here, the, the uh, uh, exhibit. And then came the production of the first Blacks in the Americas website, which is one of the most popular tools that I use in my classroom. I've been using it since, since I've been teaching and also in my ongoing research. And in terms of the digital humanities expanded as we go today, just talking about the research and how we I connected because we're going to have an ongoing conversation. It has become part of my classroom. It has become part of my pedagogy and it has become part of my teaching and learning because I learn at the same time because <laughs> students, they're all engineers. They know so much. And sometimes I want to teach them something on a tool and they end up saying, no, but professor, you can use this instead. And I go, bueno, pues ya dejémoslo ahí. You know, that, that's that, you know. Now you know more than I did. Now I can integrate that into my research. And, and I'm excited about digital humanities. I am not a, I'm not a, a creator of the tools, but I like to use them in, in my classroom, in my teaching. And then I guess we can expand on that when we expand the conversation. Yes. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I am simply a fan of, of the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute. Everyone who knows me at DSI um, knows when I have the opportunity to talk about the first Black site in particular um, is revolutionary for so many people. Um, not only because it challenges stereotypes about the Dominican Republic, stereotypes about anti-Blackness, anti-Haitianism, mm -hmm. but also like, a, I mean, it's, it. I cannot think of another site that so deeply goes into early modern Dominican Republic or Española, right, at the time. So that's who I am. I mean, I, I invite you to, you know, Google me if you are interested in my work. Um, but really, and I say that because I'm, I'm deeply conscious of um, rank and promotion in, in this space, and I have no need to, you know, self-promote at this moment. Um, but I will say that the work that Lisa does um, in her scholarship, 
she kind of downplayed who she is as well. Like she's also like one of like really revolutionizing the MCC and their focus on slavery and blackness in the Americas. And so she's, she's, she's kind of a really big deal, actually. <laughs> um, so I'm very thankful to be in conversation Thank with both you. of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So um, we're um, going to take the conversation. Uh, we're kind of just opening the floor for you to discuss your relationship with the digital humanities, really speaking about some of the challenges that you have faced when encountering some of these uh, materials online, maybe discuss how maybe there's inherent biases in some of these digital projects. Talk, we could talk about that. I think that would be interesting to see your perspective. Hmm. Yes. Um, I'd love to ask you some questions, sure. and but the chat is open as well. Yes, the chat is open. So, well. we have not been uh, as of yet, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is we were sort of yeah. all in conversation with with each other. Uh, maybe we can just start at that beginning of the gaps. Uh, you mm. talk about gender and 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 the uh, surreal the silences. Um, how did you both? work with that do oh, i imagine you encounter silences uh in the archives um so can you just elaborate on uh as a scholar um how you work with that and where then the digital world enters that as opportunity or challenge <clears throat> When we talk about silences, yo me vuelvo una fiera. Yo quiero aruñar. Okay, I, I want to, I get very upset about this, about this, this, this whole idea behind silences. Because I ask, ¿Y Santo Domingo dónde está? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't ask that simply in the digital humanities, but in general, and, and, and we should be mad at the scholarship in relation to that, because so much is said about La República Dominicana and Los Dominicanos no quieren ser negro, and Dominicans have identity issues. Mm. Well, the scholarship has had issues documenting that history. And many times scholars, say, well, well, the documents about 16th century Hispaniola were burned when the city was hijacked by Francis Drake and we don't have a lot of documentation. Pero yo van a España a buscar otra cosa. They go to Spain to document other histories mm -hmm. about other colonies mm -hmm. and but have been bypassing Santo Domingo for the longest mm -hmm. time. When, I'm, I'm, yeah. Yes, in, in the silences, right? Now, we have been trying to recuperate that with the First Blacks in the Americans project. Uh, we do have scholars who are the exception, who have written maybe a chapter, uh, articles about Santo Domingo and slavery in Santo Domingo, for instance, or the general history of Santo Domingo in language, in English, which we're, we're talking about for you know, we do have scholarship in the Dominican Republic, which are not often cited mm -hmm. by multilingual scholars. Mm -hmm. And therefore that continues to contribute to that silence. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to break away from that. Now the Archivo General de la Nación in the Dominican Republic has digital collections that are available about some of the, the archives. And even in my work, looking, uh, I wrote this article about Elena, an enslaved woman who lived in, in, in any way and used to go to, to El Cebo, but the case was not about her. And, mm -hmm. but it's available in Santo Domingo. And, and why aren't we writing more and looking and creating and sourcing the digital tools that we need, the digital spaces that we need? to unsilence that mm. history. I just, I was almost interrupting you yeah. just because you are referring and I, I asked it also, you know, for an audience who may not be too familiar here, mm -hmm. um, you refer to they, you know, and who, who, can you specify how you look at that scholarship? Is it like the for, a former generation of historians or, or 
Is it um, non-Dominican scholars? Can you specify who these they are? They, as scholars of colonial Latin America, mm -hmm. it seems as if Santo Domingo was never colonial. Mm -hmm. We were the first colonial, mm -hmm. <laughs> by the way. They, as in scholars of Atlantic slavery, mm -hmm. they, as in scholars who are writing, looking at and documenting the historiography, they, those who write about identity, who want, who go to Santo Domingo, study us, as Josefina Baez says, write about us, but don't look at the base of that history, mm -hmm. the, the conquest, the invasion, the settlement, the social foundation of Santo Domingo, the first history of the Americas. Mm -hmm. That's the day that I referred to. Yeah. Okay. Con ello que estoy brava. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little bit uh, further along in my career, which means whereas, you know, this is kind of like that, mine is like at a, at a, at a, um, a marinating, right? It's kind of like on a slow burn, which is what mm -hmm. sustains, you know, my work. Um, so at the moment, you can go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and see an exhibition on a 17th century man that everybody knew his image, but nobody knew his story, right? Mm -hmm. And, but yet a century ago, there was somebody in this city that was doing that work, right? And so the question of agency, mm -hmm. the question of the reason that I was pulled into that exhibition, I'm not an art historian, but the reason I was pulled in as a co-curator was because I had written about the man who was doing the work, right? And so, and apparently this is a very novel idea for some. For many of us who are plugging in the holes, who are filling in the silences, this is purpose-driven work. This is vocational, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for others, it's this kind of like, you know, kind of like an aesthetic choice, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so the question of who decide, how people decide what they're gonna write on, um, outside of a political impetus is always really striking to me because I don't understand it. I don't understand like how one could make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, the silences for me are opportunity. Like the silences for me never, it's not, oh, it's not there. It's, I haven't looked so everywhere. I haven't exhausted it yet. And with the Caribbean in particular, but more broadly with black history in particular, right? In this hemisphere on the African continent, there's so much <laughs> to write. There's so much we don't know. I mean, so for me, it's all of that is it's it's rich and it's just waiting for us. So I don't, you know, I think that my focus is on what gets me through what has sustained my career is that work that needs to be done. And then you look around, you kind of, I pull up and go, oh, todavía no lo están haciendo. Okay. And then I keep going. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, that's it, you know? And, you know, I've had the opportunity to support Lisette and like, you know, and and again, because you're doing amazing work, Thank right? You. And <laughs> and that's what's missing sometimes, right? It's that kind of like the active community building that is not based on ego, mm -hmm. that is not premised on who's doing what, where, mm -hmm. but rather a recognition of, hey, if we're all in this together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then mama hacerlo junto, you know. So I think I I I look at it in a in a different way. Like I look at it as again because of the opportunity that's presented to us, and then we know you know people aren't trained, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so like that's what my hope with the exhibition mm -hmm. is is that people like truly like get to Spain, get to the Canary Islands, get to where you need to go. There are stories, there are lives that are waiting for us that nobody has looked at yeah. and they're just there. And that's throughout the hemisphere, like both on both sides of the Atlantic, they're just waiting for mm -hmm. us. And so that for me, like the question of, of DH is one, a question of accessibility, but also a question when we're talking about creation of these things, we always know it's gonna be down to resources. Yes. Like mm -hmm. always. And so recognizing that, understanding that this is not an equitable field, but understanding that people are trying to do the intentions behind what people are trying to do um, is is key. You know, I think for many of us, as a user, you know, of not only the first black site, as um, for years I was a book review editor of SX Salon, so I was part of the Small Acts Universe, um, 
And, you know, my project there was as book review editor, I wanted to place reviews that re that revealed the holistic Caribbean, right? But that also, that's my disposition, like mm -hmm. as a person, is I wanted to know about the Caribbean writ large, not the nation state that follows imperial formations. But in fact, like migrations and peoples and moving, you know, the multilingual realities and not, you know, Prospero's kingdom, mm -hmm. which is what we think of. We, oh, okay, well, do, well, I esto, all right, I speak English, mm -hmm. that's it. That's not lived realities. We know that. We know that people are moving constantly. So the huge gaps of scholarship, I mean, of course, like we, mm -hmm. Santo Domingo was ground zero, you know, and the relationship between Santo Domingo and IT still is ground mm -hmm. zero. zero. Still, because we still don't have enough relation, enough scholarship on 17th century. Mm -hmm. Like we still, you know, it's kind of people want to do Duvalier and 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 Trujillo and yeah, and that's it. It's like, but wait, mm -hmm. centuries of stuff is still waiting for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I want to go back to something that you said, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to put a plug. You said silences are opportunities, mm -hmm. and with that, we are now taking that opportunity to publish in your series with SUNY Press. I'm going to put the plug there. <laughs> we have an, an, an upcoming book. It's already being looked at. Its reviews were great. And getting release forms from the contributors, breaking bondage, slavery in Spain, Puerto Rico, and Santo Domingo, because Puerto Rico too um, is absent in a way, in the scholarship, a lot has been written in Puerto Rico by Puerto Rican scholars, but not outside of Puerto Rico. That's coming soon. Brought to you, yeah. you by Afro Latinx Futures. That's mm -hmm. yes. okay. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt you know, a little bit <laughs> since I'm not being famous. PSA. PSA. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can talk later. Uh, but what I hear is um, this is very much about uh, positioning and context mm -hmm. and activism, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Now you are both, I think, in contact with students or have been or mm -hmm. still are. So in your work as a scholar, as a user, um, then you have these sources, some are digitized, some are not, you have the platforms. Um, but a lot of what you bring forward here with great passion, with, uh, which I admire and I think we all are, um, but, but how do you work with students when it comes to the contextualization and the positioning and, and, and where does this digital material is then a help and where is it a, a burden? I, I have to, like I said, I, there are certain topics that are very close to my heart. Mm. And although I am not a digital technician, I try to bring digital humanities into the classroom. Mm -hmm. Many times I enjoy it. Many times I don't mm -hmm. because I see the lack of accessibility, the lack of inequality. I, I am now having my students use Flip, mm -hmm. which is an app on their phone. Um, we're using this for them to upload interviews that in the past we used to do it in the classroom. But now, because they cannot offer their presentation in the classroom face to face, they record themselves and they give the presentation, they upload it to Flip, and we all make comments and we all also record short videos, two minute videos, one minute videos, giving each other feedback. But not all students have smartphones, mm -hmm. not all students have a, um, you know, a notebook, not all students have a tablet. Mm -hmm. And the day before yesterday, I had a student submit a handwritten assignment. Mm -hmm. And this is because so many things is going on. Yes, you can come to the campus and use our computers so that you can access those apps. But many times, in addition to taking four and five classes, you also have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. You also have a family. Mm -hmm. You also have issues that you have to deal with that may inhibit you from coming into the campus and use the computer on, on campus. And however, though, they still complete the assignment. They still come up to me and they participate. And one of the other assignments that we're doing, and Penelope, if you can open the open lab and show on screen. CUNY has the open lab website, which is a teaching and learning platform. 
And in this website, we use it to showcase our Black Studies Across the Americas program, which I co-created with my uh, great collaborators and co-conspirator, Jessica Levin and Dr. Judith Anderson. Mm -hmm. This particular program was sponsored through the Mackenzie Scott Foundation, through the President's Fund, and now also through Bresci. And students have such a great opportunity by doing this. However, we are limited because you can only fund a certain number of students. Right now we have 18 students. It's been running for three semesters now. And what we do here is that we pair faculty from non-traditional ethnic studies disciplines like math. Now we're doing science, right? Business. We pair them with one of us from ethnic studies. Then those two faculty mentor four to six students and those students produce themselves open educational materials about black studies that is then available for everyone to use to learn and to teach in the classroom. But many times, even with us offering a mere stipend of $1,500 for a student to participate in a research project for four months, they still pull up. We have students who call us and they say, I couldn't make the weekly cohort meeting. Can we meet at another time? Because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. They want to learn. They want to be creators of their own knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I've heard before the word democratize um, education, democratize knowledge. The way that we're going in education, I feel that we have to abolish ed uh, knowledge now because you have so many states who are signing legislation about banning certain book. And by having this digital humanities mm -hmm. opportunities in teaching and learning, we can, in a way, bring that knowledge to the world where they don't have access to it. And at the same time, give students the opportunity to be the creators of how they want to learn, right? If you go to the Black Studies OERs, there's a drop down menu of all of the countries that students have created content about. And the three communities that we're working with uh, this semester also include again the Garifuna, which we have been in contact with Dr. <laughs> of, uh, Lopez Oro from Hunter, mm -hmm. and we are doing IT and we're doing Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you don't see them there yet is because it's this semester we're working we're working mm -hmm. on it. So the the usability mm -hmm. definitely in student participation is there. And lastly. I promise, if you can go to the, of course, to close with that, First Blacks in the Americas, PowerPoint. This is not only a site, and I really want to highlight this for scholars, mm -hmm. for us to write, for us to do research mm -hmm. about the First Blacks in, in La Española. But if you go to the list, go to the second slide, these are assignments that I pulled from a workshop that I conducted. And the second slide shows you one of the assignments that I do every semester with my students, where students have to go into the First Blacks website. They have to pick a document. They have to answer five to six questions. And this is the result of it. But one of the most important things that I wanna show is that this is at a community college. Mm -hmm. When you look at these assignments, because there's a myth about community college. This is a myth about the quality of community college education. And my students are great. Mm -hmm. My students are brilliant. And they can do this work. High school students can do this work. And briefly, I just want to go to the next slide and show you just a list. This is just an example of the assignments. Now, some of the, and this is just a few, you can recreate a timeline using the First Blacks in the Americas website. You can create a comparative timeline. You can use Google Maps to search locations or ESRI, which if you are a CUNY student, you can download through what the many uh, free apps that we have from the CUNY site. You can also create your own gallery. You can write profiles on people. And here I provide on the slide an example on how I have my students writing profiles to tackle that silence that we have mm -hmm. about certain histories that in our communities and in our in our people. 
<laughs> yes. And then she stopped. And so, <laughs> I was like, can I just say you go for So it. the the what all of this, I just want to underscore everything that Dr. Acosta Camiel said in that all of this equals empowerment of our students. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I know when I would bring when I would physically bring students into this room, uh, into this room, mm -hmm. and and you know, uh, you know, my 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 very favorite this librarian of the, the Dominican Studies Institute would always chafe when I would say, bring your books out. I'm telling you all this, right? She's horrified at the moment. Um, but Sarah Ponte has edited books and our students needed to know that, right? The affect, the emotional resonance that mm -hmm. this work has cannot be underscored, right? For so many of our students, they do not imagine that this resource is on this campus. Mm -hmm. They do not imagine that it is on any of the CUNY campuses. Because what we're dealing with mm -hmm. are is normally within the CUNY system, students who have grown accustomed to under-resourced spaces, such that it it triggered it, it is in their mindsets. So to be to encounter this is not to say that you know so many of our students did not have passionate educators on the high, on the secondary level they did, and then they come into whether it's a community college or a senior college within the system of CUNY and they are sometimes met with this and sometimes they're not, <laughs> right? And so it's that balance of our mm -hmm. students that our students have to deal with. They, they find folks who really care for them and they find folks who are, who, yeah. you know, who don't. Mm -hmm. And so the power of ethnic studies, the power of DH in terms of accessibility is that kind of reinforcement of who they are because so many mm -hmm. of our students, particularly in this time of between 17 and I don't know, 40, 50 years old, which is who we see, 60 mm -hmm. years old, mm -hmm. um, don't know where they fit in our societies. Mm -hmm. And when we're doing black history, multilingual black history, for many of us who are Afro-descendientes, um, it is often the first time that we see, wait a second, so we've contributed Mm -hmm. to the, the de development of all of these spaces, right? And for those of us who live in the diaspora mm -hmm. to say, oh, wait, but they're, but Caribbean peoples who were here also developed this. All of this is empowerment, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that that's the threat. Like, that's why we see bans, not only on books, individual books, mm -hmm. but also on whole curricula when it comes to African-American studies, for example, mm -hmm. and the continuing fight, right? To get ethnic, I mean, for all of us who are involved in this work, we may think, we're we're in the trenches of it, but then you look at the statistics, and it's like three mm percent -hmm. of universities in this country maybe have something, maybe, and they may have just black studies. They may have black studies and Latinx studies. They rarely have black studies, Latinx studies, and Asian studies or Asian American studies. And so it's it's part of a larger discussion, mm -hmm. right? Of of of. We know the work that we're doing and we know the power of the work that we're doing, but we're not the only ones who know the power of the work that we're doing. Yeah. Thank you, that's beautiful. I just want to acknowledge that in our audience uh, online, I know there are also people from the Caribbean itself. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks also to, uh, to the work of, for instance, Acuriel uh, for promoting mm -hmm. uh, and DLOG for promoting mm -hmm. this. And, um, you referred to the specific uh, education situation here in, in, uh, in the US and it said city colleges uh, reminded me that when I just entered this morning with a friend and colleague from Curacao who was visiting me and we I showed her around here, the first thing we noticed were some buckets on the floor because the ceiling was mm -hmm. leaking and we were both like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know where we come from. Um, but the, oh, these these are so similar situations. And I say this because uh, very often in the Caribbean, it's thought like you know the U U.S. They have money and they, mm -hmm. uh, but there's so much, especially in that context of first gen students and the political. Also, like you uh, emphasize the political context uh, that is very challenging. Um, now I just. We may come back to this, but if you allow me, I want to go back to uh, digital versus real sources. I'm a historian, so we, we also want to smell the sources, you know, <laughs> and feel them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how do you relate to that? And how do you relate to what Putnam says about that, that you may be losing something when you are only working with digital sources in the digital space? How do you relate to that? I, I think the not the easiest way to to answer that or to tackle with that, to live mm -hmm. with that, is saying you have to balance and you have to, you lose something, you win something. For, for me as a historian, having the opportunity to look at sources digitally is, is, is cheaper, is more accessible mm -hmm. because I don't have to travel mm -hmm. overseas, or, or even the time that it would take mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. me to go to certain archival repositories, right? That the solution is there, mm -hmm. of course. But it's always not that simple because even with having the accessibility, mm -hmm. many places that has these archives, that has these documents, sometimes they're not fully developed. They don't have the tools. Uh, for instance, if you want, there are still collections in Puerto Rico that are not digitized, mm -hmm. so you still have to go there. Or if they're digitized, the search engines, because of the lack of funds and the lack of sources. Now, yes, we with the digital humanities, we have achieved more access. We have achieved the opportunity to more access for us, and then the opportunity to to distribute, to disseminate the information. But, but when we cannot do that because many places lack uh, the resources, and when you hear me saying lack the resources, yes, we have the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute and, and here the Institute has been able to develop the landmark um, digital project that you saw, First Blacks, also the Dominican Music in the, in the US, the Spanish Paleography Teaching and Learning Tool. But to do that, they had to spend weeks nights and many times I was here to apply for a grant mm -hmm. and who's getting the grants mm -hmm. most of the times I don't have the statistics but it seems that mainly the universities was lot, lots of trees in them or the ones that have endowment mm -hmm. and those places they get two million dollars 2.7 million dollars mm -hmm. we really have to fight to get 150 thousand mm -hmm. dollars just to start a project. Mm -hmm. And then we have to justify how it is important to our communities so that we can then make it available. And therefore, when I look at Putnam's um, article, I say, you know, yes, we have some things, we lose some things, but you can't just stop there. You have to continue. And, and they're making us work hard for it. We just can't get tired so that we can continue to mm -hmm. get to those places and get the information that we want to produce more information and make it more available for others. It's all, it's all Maranage. Like it's all, you yeah. know, Sima Huna. Yeah. yeah. And it has been for us. I mean, mm -hmm. we know that. Like that's the model, right? The model is we mm -hmm. understand where the resources are. We have to, we have to access those resources. Mm -hmm. um, for myself personally, I mean, I don't long for a nostalgia or a, a, this kind of nostalgic, um, you know, but be able to go to the archives. I mean, I have prior to this position in which I'm in administration at the moment, you know, I've been a professor at the City College of New York, which means I don't have a readily available summer research budget. Mm -hmm. it means I don't have thousands of dollars that I can just go wherever. I don't, you know, I'm not part of a Ford network or any of the networks. Which meant I always was, I was always, I could only do what I could do in the time and the energy that I have. And I say that as someone who is, doesn't have children, doesn't have a, ha I have family responsibility, but not by the family that I created. And so we're always, you know, the, the challenge I think for us is the, the, the time and the energy. And again, the creation of a community that would sustain that because, you know, when we think about those who normally, you know, all of our, our fields are built by or carried on by, sustained mm -hmm. by men of some considerable wealth. Mm -hmm. If you do not fit mm -hmm. in that paradigm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, 
it's going to be a struggle, right? And so like, so way we see the way that people get around that by, okay, well, they have a job in a moneyed institution. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Are they pulling folks with them? Or are they just by themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's how people have been doing what they want. And, you know, I'm, I'm a literature scholar, right? Which means I adore going into a library and just smelling mm -hmm. what smells like, you know, cookies and cream because I know it's old pages. Like, mm -hmm. I love that. Um, but then I combat that with the urgency of the work that needs to get done. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, I am not free enough. It's, a, it's an incredible privilege to say, you know, this will come out in 10 years. And I'm not talking about the historical mm -hmm. imperative that I need mm -hmm. 10 years to do it. Me and my impatience goes, I got two years, I got three years, like it has to get out, it has to get out, which is why that's the answer to when people say, why are you so prolific? Because <laughs> I need to get that. It's my own impatience and it's my understanding that like the work needs to get out mm -hmm. and then the work needs to do what it needs to do. It has to open up um, the paths and it for students, for fellow scholars, um, so yeah, I don't I don't wax nostalgic about you know my inability to access mm -hmm. archives. Like that for me is a very privileged position to take, and I don't have it. It's so beautiful it, how you share so much with us that feeds into the next panel where we look mm -hmm. at how do you go from ideas to projects mm -hmm. and how do you position yourself when you apply for funding. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to add, and, and it's interesting because we didn't have a conversation before, we just saw each other here, but you you said about the nostalgia, not having that nostalgia to go to the archives and touch the material because it has to get done. Mm -hmm. And and you also mentioned Maranaj, and in my notes here, I have rebel approaches. Mm -hmm. this, this is what I wrote here on my notes to, mm -hmm. to as one of the things to discuss today. And in terms of the approaches that we see in the age, and I wrote down rebel approaches, and I, I wrote down here Dr. Jessica Marie Johnson's mm -hmm. work on Live X Code and Dr. Yomaira mm -hmm. uh, Yogi Figueroa Vasquez and Electric Maranaj mm -hmm. Taller, the workshop that they have. Mm -hmm. And it is because they know the work has to get done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The work, we just can't. We just can't sit here and, and wait and say, well, you know, I'll get this grant to travel to the Bahamas and look at the archives there. I'll get this, this grant to travel to Mexico and look at the archives there. We don't have that much. We don't have that time. Mm -hmm. Actually, we haven't had time mm -hmm. for the past 520 something years. They never give us time. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the work has to get done. And digital humanists are doing what they can. Mm -hmm to get it done yeah. and to get it out there in this type, with this type of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I just, I love that you shouted Jessica and Jamal. Oh. <laughs> like, those are two of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> yeah, I had right here on my notes. Yeah. See? <laughs> Re Rebel approaches. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. And also, but and I do want to say, I want to call attention to, and Black women approaches. Yes. Mm -hmm. I Very just important. want to say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Well, we can come back to that. Yeah, yeah. I just mm -hmm. with the twenty minutes that we have, I just want to see if there are quite wow. <laughs> so, you soon to be yes. <laughs> Um What's going on here? The the real <clears throat> boss here is Penelope, and then we all yeah. There's just one Penelope. What's going on? Can can uh, Sarah? Ask a question, Sophia. Sophia. I always say that. Yeah. Well, uh, thank Sorry, you Sophia. So much for this conversation. I mean, two of my personal heroines. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I want to. My question is. I have so many things to say, but my question is kind of around this, around the way that this explains the district. So. Mm. so I am, to my knowledge, one of two. I'm looking for others. Um, people getting a PhD in a black studies, I mean, a black studies or African and African diaspora studies department in the mm -hmm. United States mm -hmm. that is doing a dissertation on Dominican studies. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And for me, what I have found is that the way that black studies methodologically mm -hmm. approaches questions of the archive mm -hmm. 
essentially we throw away this idea of silences, right? We have the archival mm -hmm. cross grain. Mm -hmm. We have the different sonorities of the archive. Mm -hmm. We have apopopulation. Mm -hmm. We have all of these Black women studies approaches mm -hmm. to essentially completely abandoning this idea that silence means that there it was nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that oftentimes when we talk about silences, there's this perception that there is no action because the archive cannot see it. Mm. Um, so I I find that in history, mm -hmm. and as someone right now who is writing about La Negra del Hospital, I hope that Dr. Lisa Conia La Costa will get on her dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that. What's that? That I think that what is interesting is like what I can say as a person who is transdisciplinary mm -hmm. trained in history and literature, mm -hmm. as opposed to what people can say in history. So I was hoping mm -hmm. that you could talk about um, the ways that you have encountered challenges when when essentially um, when creating abundance where there is where there's a scarcity of information, mm -hmm. or creating abundance where there are fragments, you know, mm -hmm. of an era, for instance, mm -hmm. um, in trying to write for a history publication. Mm -hmm. um, and the ways Dr. Valdez said you have used the advantages of the intersection of history and literature to write when people say that you can't. Um, okay, and thank you for <laughs> the invitation. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Um, Creating abundance where we find the challenges, right? And, and you bring up Elena, for instance. I think it was very difficult for me to reframe or to frame Elena's story from the Black perspective, because as we said before, Dominicans are not Black, or is the that's word, the you know, that's the perception in the story. And then ask them, so when and where did slavery start in the Americas after Christopher Columbus? Mm -hmm. If they don't give you Santo Domingo as an answer, as Dr. Torres Aya says, the cradle of blackness in the Americas, then they really don't know slavery in the Americas, mm -hmm. including slavery in the United States. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how many job applications I sent to so many places trying to find a job in as a historian mm -hmm. speaking about Atlantic slavery mm -hmm. because of how Atlantic slavery is framed. Mm -hmm. And I had to create Elena in her life and her story and pull from the rest of that story in the Caribbean, in the US, mm -hmm. including the, theoret the theoretical approach in order to give Elena life. Mm -hmm. So I would say, um, to create that abundance, if, despite what we may think and what we may feel in relation to what scholars have been creating and to what scholars are or, or have created and continue to create, ask those scholars questions and pull from that work. To, to create that abundance, I pulled from Dr. Jessica Murray Johnson's work in for that article from Aisha Finch's work mm -hmm. for that article, mm -hmm. Tamara Walker's work for that article, and the Stephanie Camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. so it, it wasn't that it, it wasn't there, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the African diaspora, mm -hmm. right, goes beyond what we know and what we study here in the United States. And it is our responsibility as Dominican scholars or people studying. Uh, the history of Santo Domingo to produce that abundance in conversation with what other people are leaving out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to just add to that by saying Simahronaje is not just, it's, it's our thinking as well, meaning everything is accessible to you, mm -hmm. meaning a discipline is going to do just that. And so it's too, it's also your position at this moment. You are a PhD student writing your dissertation. Your goal is to defend your dissertation, punto ya, which means if you have people, <laughs> which means if your committee says, ahí mi mito, ahí mi mito, brinca. Why? Because your goal is to get your dissertation done. Your goal is to, to get a job. That's your goal. Post that, 
right? Once those two things are secured, like your dissertation doesn't have to be your first book. I know that's revolutionary. Yes. Mm -hmm. It does not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but here's the thing. There are people who go, oh no, but that's more difficult, blah, blah, blah. See, Mahlonai is like step back and be strategic about what you have to do. Yes. Period. Yes. And, but you have to be very clear on what your goals are and when your goals happen. Because there are people who are like, well, like, we're going to light this up. Mm -hmm. We're going to set mm -hmm. the rebellion off. Mm -hmm. Are you in a position to set the rebellion off if you're an adjunct professor? Or are you much better when you're tenured? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say, bueno, vamos a esperar aquí, because neither Jessica, ni Jessica, ni Jomaida, ni, Lise, ni Lisette, is, is, are, they're not waiting. Mm -hmm. But they have tenure track positions, and they have tenured positions. You have to know where you're at, always. And so sometimes when people come in, they go, okay, well, we're going to just revolutionize everything. I, no, absolutely. I just, I want to add to that. Surround yourself because the abundance, you are the abundance. Amen. You are the archive yep. for that information. Yep. They, we don't have the name of La Negra del Hospital. Maybe we can find it. Maybe we cannot. But the fact who she was at the time is extremely important and is not there, right? So because you are the abundance, Surround yourself with people who believe in the abundance that you can create from that work, not the abundance that is already there, right. lingering in right. other places, or the abundance that cannot be created. And my dissertation was solely focused on the first Spanish women mm -hmm. towards the towards the theory about Spanish women in Hispaniola, right? But then after looking at documents here at the Dominican Studies Institute with Professor Stevens, we started finding free and enslaved Black women. And I said, oh my God, I nothing has been written about all of the women mm -hmm. in Hispaniola, including Anacaona, because we also don't have much about the indigenous women. Mm -hmm. And it was not until I think maybe three years later after I had defended my dissertation, I was at a gathering and someone said, have you spoken to Jennifer Morgan? Mm -hmm. And I said, how? Because like <laughs> the, the, right. the Jennifer. And she's like, yes, you know, I'm friends with her. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, oh, I felt such a relief because I, I felt the invitation. Mm -hmm. And Professor Alexandra, she connected with connected me with Dr. Morgan. I sent an email and she said, yeah, let's meet for coffee. Dr. Morgan said, let's meet. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait, did she just respond to my email? Let's meet for coffee. And we had coffee and I explained to her my, wh where I was running into a wall in terms of how to present my work about gender. I didn't want it to be just about the white women in Hispaniola. I didn't want it to be just about the black women free and enslaved in Hispaniola or the Taino women, I just wanted it to be about women. That way I can have many doors open and I can have opportunities to write about all of them and also write about the men. And in that conversation, you know, Jennifer said, well, when they ask you what your research focus is, which I used in my introduction earlier, mm -hmm. she said, just say that you write about gender, slavery and resistance. Mm -hmm. That includes mm -hmm. everything. You write about slavery, you write about the resistance, which was the status quo in the society at the time, and you're writing about the women, all of the women. So surround yourself and, and talk. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes people don't like mm -hmm. to share their work. They don't, they don't like to mention things. You also have to trust who these people are. Um, and I really mean that. Mm -hmm. I had mm -hmm. someone email me about my work and then they 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 submitted a proposal with my presentation title. And then I was like, wow, <laughs> yes. Uh, so be careful with that. But at the same time, share your inquietudes mm. and, and speak about them so that they can expand and you can connect with those generous people who believe in your abundance. Mm -hmm. Thank can, you. Yeah, just briefly, because mm -hmm. we are sort of drifting away from the humanities, but I love <laughs> the passion with which you respond to uh, Sophia, and Sophia uh, will be back again in the, the last panel of the day. So uh, I just, but I Vanessa, just, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that Jennifer Morgan is who she is because there's trust there, right? And in network building, whether it's DH or just in general, 
um, you know, again, the way that our students so often are trained at this moment is you have to build a brand, you have to build a network, you have to go to the conferences, you have to do. And I tell people, please follow your spirit. Definitely. If you go meet somebody and you're like, oof, no, nah, don't force it. Yeah. Don't say, oh, but I have to go to the coffee. I have to. And they could be like, oh, no, but it's a super estrella. That don't. If something is telling you don't do it, don't do it, period. You know, like that's it. And I think that, again, that is relying on your own knowledge. Like, and so, so often we wait for permission, right? And we wait for the blessing and we wait for the like, but here's the hierarchy, but I can't, we give each other permission as peers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're back you know? to reinforcement <laughs> of who they are as students and who we are as- We all have knowledges. And I think that that's, I think again, within the hierarchy of academia and anywhere. I mean, that's humans like there, we know the hier hierarchy, you know, implicates and implicates power. And we know that. So if you want to do anything that redistributes power, that's off top by definition revolutionary. And so you have to be strategic about what you're doing, how you're doing it, who you're doing it with. And the people who feed your spirit, the people who feed you, who can say, okay, yes, like stay there period. They may be the super, the superstars. They may not. The superstar may be all the way up here and going like, yes. And that's enough for you to go. You have been with Dr. Hernandez for how long? Like, <laughs> you know what that feels like, you know? So yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's the kind of just, again, and we are, we are beyond DH as a field, but we are talking more broadly again about the creation of community and the encouragement of our scholars, right? Because at the end of the day, like I, you know, I'm. I think I'm in terms of like the career. I'm the I'm the senior scholar on this panel, which is freaky. Um, but my work in some way then allows for her work. Her work in some ways allows for your work. That's how we keep it going, and that's how that that's who we come from. And so the idea that we allow for discipline, imposed discipline, man-made imposed discipline. That's not our people have survived for millennia for a reason. Alex is in the back looking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just yeah. We have nine questions from yeah. Just one question, just to conclude. Oh. Yeah. And there's oh, a question. Nine questions. Yeah. Oh, nine questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is from Nathan Dice. I uh, love this conversation and your insistence on urgency. I'm also struck by the silences that are maintained and cultivated by the lack of preservation or citations, such as the solidarity between historically black colleges mm -hmm. versus the nine America and the Caribbean. What are your deafening and engineer silences? What stands out to you that most urgently needs to be addressed? I love it. We have to be concise, I, Mark. I, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I think the key word there is solidarity. Yep. And, and you alluded to that before in terms of how we support each other. Mm -hmm. And the, the hashtag, cite Black women. Yes. Um, cite each other. Cite the people that you know. Citing the work of a specific person is political. Yep. It's strategic. And yep. many times it is used to silence certain histories. That's it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so with that knowledge, <laughs> go beyond if you think that what you what you, where you've looked, particularly if it's traditional training, I promise you black people have done it already. Like in HBCUs at the Shawbrook Center for Research in Black Culture. Um so go beyond what you go. We all go beyond our training. Mm -hmm. Like we just all do. Like it just, again, it's implicit to me, this kind of what we are taught are tools and more often than not tools to, to navigate. What are there? So like continue learning, continue growing, you know? I mean, that's that's it. So thank you, Dr. Dyes for that question. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, anyone else? I know Alex. Alex, Alex. you had a I question. I want to do a follow up to this question, but that it brings it back to the digital humanities. Earlier, I think it was you who said that, that, that you know, digital humanities are the step sort of for the work that needs to be for you. I, I don't know if we're going to talk about that, that concept of like, you know, it's a self publishing within digital humanities that allows you that affordance that, you know, we're going to wait for, for the discipline. To say, hey, you can do this or you cannot do this, but there's some work that needs to go beyond the disciplines and the hierarchy in order to get that work done. But here's the catch 22. Mm. 
So, so for example, I wouldn't tell a graduate student, hey, just focus on your digital kinetic story. One of my graduate students was here, and I said, no, 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 focus on your dissertation. Same thing you just said. Mm -hmm. But then also an assistant professor, all the young people that come in get, getting hired at PT at the, uh, at, in the department, we also, they like, oh, I want to do the cool things now that I'm assistant professor. I'm like, no, 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 no. Not right. Yet, exactly. Not yet. right. Um, exactly. No, no, no. It can be a little side hustle you have on Friday after <laughs> if you want, but you got, I really need you to write the books. Yep. Until you get to the tenure and then like all of a sudden, like, uh, okay, finally, mm -hmm. I am going to do this work. I needed pushing 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the that's the catch when it goes kind of open from your experiences that you can address because right now, if you don't, right now, the way that the the the, the, the profession is designed mm -hmm. in the humanities at, the, at least is media specific, which to me seems absurd mm -hmm. that we actually take the medium Mm -hmm. and say it is in that medium mm -hmm. that you're going to produce your knowledge yep when we know this other media that the, that all the young people the whole world has been engrossed in yep. that allows you to produce text image video a sound then it's excluded from that uh how, how are we going to change that media specificity mm -hmm. so that we can actually be able to tell our graduate students oh man you wanted to do this really cool uh, project with mm -hmm. this uh, uh, digital project with this particular set of managers nobody has, nobody has ever paid attention to. Mm -hmm. uh, how are we going to, we're going to get there. We got to wait for you to be provost. <laughs> no, but I mean, <laughs> but you know what I mean? But like the people, like ultimately the people who value it have to be in positions of power in order to change tenure specificities. Mm -hmm. That's what, what we were, right? I'm an associate provost. There's the associate part, Papa. Like when we when we take that off, then then you follow me and go, what's going on in that school? And then we'll you know we'll come back and you can hold me accountable. I promise you, I'm on the web. I promise you, hold me accountable. <laughs> Alex, I actually have good news for you. BMCC is part of a cohort of uh, universities and deans are included in this project. I think it's with the University of Michigan, and. I think, I can't remember, it's, hopefully I don't get crucified for saying the wrong university, but it's called Humetrics, mm -hmm. Re-Envisioning Scholarship. Mm -hmm. And there we have been meeting the whole semester to talk about the, to hold the academia accountable, to hold the administration accountable in terms of um, valuing our work and the work that we create, whether it is digital, whether it is you know in print, and, and the many projects that are intertwined with the digital humanities so that incoming graduate students can, with passion and with their interest, develop digital humanities projects that it's going to count towards their, their academic. But I, think that, I mean, again, that's just it. Again, it, it is the question of people being empowered to be able to mm -hmm. then say, okay, let's broaden what, what is tenure eligible, right? And that's institution by institution. And so the work that is being done by all, the work that you're doing, right? Like you are not in a vacuum. And so what you're doing and what you have done for years, what Jessica is doing, what, what Yomaira is doing, what all these collectives are doing, what Skylar's doing, what D-Locker do, all of these collectives, right? It does not escape the notice of folks, but it's always gonna be the question of, are they attributing value to it? And so I think that like what we're seeing, it's all of this is a, a, a tremendous case study that is working. So I, I wish I could put a timeline on it and be like, okay, well, in 10 years, I do think things are changing tremendously. I do think- for people like me, but I want like young people to live in that world, you know? Like, I'm not on this panel, but like- <laughs> <laughs> There is this like scaffolding that we need to give our students. Uh, there is more. There is more than one way to fulfill the assignment. Mm -hmm. There is more than one way to write a dissertation. There is more than one way to uh, create a paper for create your qualifying exam papers. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that when you approach, when you have the raw materials of original manuscripts, like of like that, of like digital digital archives that haven't been read with the attention to Dominican society. That you already have the metadata, you already have the metadata of mm -hmm. the digital platform, right? Mm -hmm. You just have to curate it. And then what is the assignment? The assignment is curated in a way that fulfills a multimodal dissertation process. If the four people on your committee will recognize that. But if they want a book, uh -huh. Or if they want it in print, yes. then guess what? You friggin' do it in print. So you get your PhD, keeping all of this and then going, right. 
and now like now I but that's again it's just be, from from my perspective it is always just keeping really clear because we lose too many people on the tenure track who have who come with their passion and then it's like guess what now you don't you've lost that job because you haven't fulfilled what we have said you need to fulfill that's the balance I, I have a perfect example this was not intentional but I have a chapter coming out in a book that is about digital humanities. That is not my area. That chapter technically should not count towards my tenure, right? But it should be part of my scholarship because the digital humanities that I speak about in the chapter are linked to my work. Mm -hmm. And it's coming out in the book with SUNY Press, uh, Crossing Digital Fronteras mm -hmm. by Isabel Martinez, Angel Nieves, Angel David Nieves and Irma Montelongo. And the title of my chapter is Digital Pedagogy in a Multicultural Setting, Learning History and Connecting Through Technology. And that's where I, Joe, I slip in the, <laughs> my work, right, correct, and connected to the digital humanities. But here's what I would say as a senior scholar, is that when you write your two pages that are describing your research for your profile, you highlight yourself as a digital humanist yes. and you make it legible. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's all strategic. Okay. it's been one o'clock uh this it's been meaning, yeah. we're, we're meaning with over time you sort of thank you uh what time is yeah uh, thank you for stepping in this, this discussion we went i just want to surprise you with one last question oh just top of your head yeah what do you take you've been i think you didn't disagree that's that's what i take with me i you were very fierce, very powerful. I just want to, for you each, what do you take yourself, what do you take with you out of this conversation that sort of surprised you or you never thought about? What do you take with you as new? Top of your head. We don't have the freedom that we need to create the digital humanities that we want in our spaces. Um, we don't have those resources but we shouldn't wait for it. Mm -hmm. We could be maroons mm -hmm. and figure it out. The bottom line is that I need money. Administrators listening, watching, I want money to continue with my Black Studies Across the Americas project, yes. okay? FYI. I'm not gonna sit and wait for them to give me that money. I'm, gonna to, I'm going to continue looking. Mm -hmm. Last semester, we got a thousand from La Guardia. We got a thousand from Echo, the CUNY Graduate Center. We got two thousand from NYU. We got una alcancilla, mm -hmm. a piggy bank. Don't yeah. wait. Be a digital maroon. Mm -hmm. Be a scholar maroon. Be a knowledge maroon, so that mm -hmm. you can continue with the work. I think I'm surprised by. I'm surprised by the, the lack of venues for these conversations because we we could have had this conversation without any questions. Mm -hmm. And it, what it speaks to me is like the, the, the dearth of opportunities. And so we have to do, I think the, again, the opportunity is to do better and to do more um, because I thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for the invitation always to participate in anything with DSI. Um, but for me, it, it recalls for me, like we need to do better and we need to share the knowledge in a more effective way. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for those who are online, we are back in one hour. For those who are here, we have lunch. So let's have lunch. Okay. And this is to celebrate Cuban patrimony. And you see the URL because I am a good librarian. You see the URL at the bottom of the screen there. We also have a wonderful Caribbean maps collection with examples from as early as the 17th century all the way up to the 21st century. And I would say that the crown jewel in our collections are the newspapers. We have the largest repository of digitized, digitized newspaper from the Caribbean on DLOC. We have newspapers from all over the Caribbean. If you're looking for it, we probably have it. So how did DLOC get started? 
The idea for DLOC, and you can see our little timeline here, was presented at the 2004 conference of the Association of Caribbean University Research and Institutional Libraries, another mouthful. So that one we'll just call Acuril. <laughs> Three librarians from the University of the Virgin Islands, the University of Florida and Florida International University convened a working group where they presented the idea of a digital library comprised of partners in the Caribbean and Circum Caribbean. In July, 2004, a planning committee met in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and DLOC became a reality with nine founding partners. <clears throat> Today, almost 20 years later, and you heard it here first, hashtag DLOC20, DLOC has over 80 partners and associate partners, including the original nine. It must be noted that from its very beginning, DLOC has and continues to follow a post-custodial model. Now, that's a real fancy way of saying that our partners do not have to transfer physical materials to us. We make no claims of ownership on the material that is on our website. When we get a permission or use request, those are referred to the partner who then decides whether to grant the request. The digitized resources, for lack of a better term, live on our website, www.dlock.com. And that website first launched in 2006. In 2021, the site interface underwent a significant upgrade. This upgrade makes the site more mobile friendly. Our site is also not graphic heavy because we recognize that many in the Caribbean access the internet using their cellular data. In 2022, the Revitalizing the Digital Library of the Caribbean Initiative received funding from the Mellon Foundation. Revitalizing DLOC, as we call it, is a multi-year award that is intended to sustain and build DLOC with the goal of reinforcing and strengthening the organization and its collections. It's supposed to last four years, and it is focused on building DLOC's social fabric by focusing on partner engagement, enriching open access educational resources, establishing a rights advisory network, and documenting and guiding for the future engagement. Revitalizing DLOC is an opportunity for us to reinvest in our partners who are, as our organizational chart shows, at the heart of what we do. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Perry who will give you a little bit more background on the grant. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Stephanie, and thanks to all of you. Um, it's wonderful to join everybody today, and I'm grateful for the virtual option so we can be here online with everybody. Um, again, I'm Perry Collins. Um, I am the interim chair for our Digital Partnerships and Strategies Unit, which oversees um, operations for DLOC, as well as our library publishing program and a number of other programs. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank um, those who came before us, and there are way too many to name, um, but especially Miguel Asensio, the former executive director of the Digital Library of the Caribbean, and Lori Taylor, who um, was very instrumental in working toward um, pretty much everything we're talking about today, including the grant I'll talk about, um, and has recently taken a position at the University of Connecticut. So they're very much missed in this work, but we're happy for them. Um, so my role really with DLOC um, is to provide some oversight and administration of the grant that I'll talk about um, in some detail in a moment, but I'm also the liaison to DLOC for copyright and open educational resources. Um, and so I will especially be um, working as part of this grant on a piece I won't talk very much about today, which is thinking about how we grapple with rights issues um, in these collections um, as a community. Um, so, you know, funding is 
really key to DLOC. Um, in the last slide, um, you could see that there is kind of a piece off to the side that talks about members or those that are contributing funds to DLOC. That said, it's really important that this is not a pay to play kind of community. Um, no one has to buy into DLOC. No one has to pay to be a member of DLOC. Um, the hub institutions provide that hosting um, and um, kind of make use of the infrastructure that we have at our disposal to make sure that we're providing um, sort of living up to the mission of DLOC in terms of preservation and access. Um, you, can, you can go back to the next slide, Stephanie, thank you. Um, so the funding is really key though, um, but not necessarily in the ways that you might think. So for instance, um, while we don't necessarily ask anyone to pay into DLOC, of course, there are many different partners with many different projects providing all kinds of in-kind support in terms of their people and labor and time, um, thinking about their collections, caring for collections, digitizing, getting equipment. There's so much work that goes into DLOC behind the scenes. Um, and then also many different grants that are going on, either directly to the hub institution, sort of hosting DLOC, or to many different partners. Again, we have a network now of over 80 partners. Um, and so there are many different kinds of grants at many different levels for digitization, for public humanities programs, for um, digital projects. Um, and so really, um, you know, today I'll, I'll focus on a really large grant that we've been awarded um, and talk about, kind of break that down. But I do want to really emphasize that just as DLAC is a collection of collections, it's also um, made up of many different kind of a patchwork of funding um, as we go through. And so there's always a way to kind of participate in DLAC, and it doesn't necessarily have to come with a large amount of funding. Um, so the revitalizing the Digital Library of the Caribbean project, even in its title, really reflects a challenge that we have had over the years. Um, I've been involved with DLOC for about four years now, um, but really for quite a few years, one of the biggest challenges we had as the community grew and grew and grew was really um, their, our capacity to be able to proactively engage with and facilitate conversations among partners in the community. Um, so we might be able to, for instance, respond to questions, or if someone could email us and ask for help on something, we could do that. But we weren't necessarily taking the time, we didn't necessarily have the time to really sit down and say, how can we facilitate um, conversations via online workshops? Or how can we um, think a little bit more about the kinds of resources we're being asked for again and again, and bring together expertise in DLOC to actually make those resources a possibility? possibility, um, and thinking also about things like documentation. So when we began talking to the Mellon Foundation, our funder for this award, um, a little over a year and a half ago, you know, one of the things I think maybe surprised them a bit was that we said, you know, technology isn't necessarily what we're most in need of. We have people on staff, we have a new interface. It's not to say that there's no work to be done on the technical side, but what we're most in need of is funding that will really um, reinforce the, what I think of as kind of the social fabric of DLOC, of making sure that we have, we're documenting all the expertise and knowledge um, and doing some of the legacy work that we haven't been able to do with partners just because of everyone's lack of time. Um, and so we were awarded um, a little over a year ago, um, a $2 million award that will last over the course of four years. Um, and we will now talk about a couple of different pieces of this today. We aren't going to cover everything. I do want to say one important piece of this for us is to make sure that as much as possible, we are um, sort of sending money outward, that we have programs that are really giving back to our partners, and that this is something that while we have hired core staff at the University of Florida, sort of the one of the hubs for the Digital Library of the Caribbean, we're trying to make sure that we are compensating partners for the work that they're doing and other experts as well. So Stephanie, I'll leave it to you for the next part. Let me not forget to unmute myself. It's only been, what, four years? <laughs> so one of the uh, partner engagement programs that we are 
doing is called the intensive planning engagements. And each year of the grant, DLOC staff and hired consultants work closely with four partners to assess their organizational goals and capacity. All of this with an eye toward collection development and greater mutually beneficial collaboration with DLOC. The cohort for year one includes uh, the University of the Virgin Islands, Create Caribbean, Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator, and Manioc Université des Antilles. The, at the end of the intensive year, each organization will produce a summary of activities and a three to five year plan that will be developed in conjunction with their consultants. These documents are going to be made available on DLOC for current and future partner reference. One of the things that we realize here at the University of Florida and likely also at Florida International University, our two hubs, is that our experiences as US-based institutions are not necessarily the same, are not the same as the ones that institutions in the Caribbean have. So we want to make sure that we understand what those experiences are and that our partners who are based in the Caribbean, who may not be going through the intensives, will have uh, an example to follow. By the time the grant is over in 2026, we will have worked with 16 DLOC partners. For DLOC, the intensive year experience will contribute to our refinement of a menu of sustainable technical assistance services. This will enable us to help our partners better. We are at about the midpoint of year one and the call for year two participants will be going out in the next few months. And Perry, I will turn it over to you so you can talk about the educational resources that we are developing. Great, thanks. Um, the other piece we wanted to highlight today, um, especially thinking about kind of our um, funding for the collective in mind, um, work around teaching and educational materials has been ongoing in DLOC since the very beginning. There is a sort of teaching section of DLOC, and this is something our scholarly advisory board, especially um, which Alex sits on as well, um, has been really interested in. Um, so a few years ago, um, Stephanie, if you want to go to the next slide, and I'll make you go back and forth, sorry. <laughs> um, a few years ago, um, I was really privileged to be part of um, Migration, Mobility, Sustainability, a Caribbean Studies and Digital Humanities, or really Digital Pedagogy Institute. This was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it took place at the University of Florida, but brought together about 40 um, people funded to come to Gainesville um, and really learn together um, for about a week. Um, this really Kind of gave us a foundation for thinking about open educational resources, resources that are not only free to access on DLOC, but can also be adapted and repurposed um, for the classroom. And so if you want to go back, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, and so we really wanted to build on this. Um, we were very fortunate that um, a previous DLOC intern, Tanya Rios Marrero, um, has joined the project and is leading this component, um, giving away stipends, small stipends, but stipends that will help instructors hopefully take materials that they're already digging into, already teaching, um, and kind of package those up for others who might access them through DLOC. So we're just in the middle of the first year of review for these, so we don't quite know what we're going to see or what will be funded this time around, um, but we are expecting a second call for proposals um, in November. And we have about mm, $35,000, $40,000 a year um, to give away in stipends. So that's been something that we're really excited about to kind of update and enhance that teaching section of DLOC. And I think with that, um, we had a couple of other slides, but I think given the time, let's go ahead and um, pass off to, to Alex. And thank you all so much. Stephanie, was there anything else you wanted to add? No, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to getting your questions.
Alex, the floor is yours. Hey, Bethany, Perry, can you hear me uh, from this? Oh, uh, you can hear me? Because the mic is over there, but I'm talking. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, all right, so the, the panel was on from idea to project. Mm -hmm. So I'm torn because uh, uh, Perry and Stephanie just presented on D log, but there wasn't much of that thematic content there on like how to execute from uh, from idea to project. So I'm gonna try to do a little bit of both and integrate it into 10 or 15 minutes, uh, the conversation. So first of all, can everybody hear me in the room? Yes, yes you can hear me good, okay. And on Zoom, I'm, I, I already confirmed. So uh, first of all, most of the conversation we've had all day long has focused on one particular type of digital humanities work built around collections of archival materials, cultural artifacts. And that is a very important part of digital humanities. Uh, I've been in digital humanities for 15 years so now or 20, I don't remember. And at my completely anecdotal uh, data tells me that uh, about 80% of digital humanities activity is precisely that. But I wanna inspire you to start thinking about that other 20%. And after I do inspire you, I'm gonna show you the money uh, to perhaps uh, help you to go from idea to project. Now, for the first type of project, the sort of uh, collection-centric, uh, cultural artifact-centric uh, uh, type of project that imagines an interface where you encounter one cultural artifact at a time, perhaps surrounded by some narrative, uh, some context. Um, there's two ways to go about it, more or less. Uh, the two most famous ways to go about that one from idea to project in the, in the Caribbean studies is to either use Omeka, which is used here, which is a popular tool, or to partner with DLOC to do something a little bit more ambitious. Those are the two usual suspects. I myself am the designer of a third way that I designed uh, for use in the Caribbean where we have electricity problem, bandwidth problem, uh, like uh, already Perry and Stephanie pointed out, uh, people access a lot of these projects through cellular data. You have to buy a card, at least in Dominican Republic, you still have to go uh, to Orange and get one of those cards uh, and you're paying for using the internet. And that third option is called WAX. And uh, WAX is an interesting tool because WAX forces you to learn a lot more technology than either a partnership with DLOC or, an, or building an Omega site does. But it is in that, in that ask to ask you to learn a, more technology that the other possibilities open up, that 20% I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit now before I tell you how, to, how we're gonna support you in that journey. And uh, this is us, remember, remember what I said when Sophia uh, uh, asked her question. This is something that we, we treat with kitty gloves because of the, of the uh, rules about tenure and promotion and dissertation guidelines for our graduate students. But of course, I never believe that the only possible meaningful employment in the academy is in a tenure track. I had never had one, a tenure job. And I never will, because I've never asked for one. And I have very meaningful employment. Uh, and so those, Almost everybody who works at the side, right? Uh, so, anyways, and uh, and the other panelists. So here is two examples. I myself, I am the builder of. I have contributed to digital humanities in the Caribbean uh, through many projects. I'm going to show you two. Uh, if I can get rid of the bar on the top, uh, I, there was a way to move in, to move this. Oh, there it is. You, you just have to grab it right there. There you go. All right. So I'm going to show you in the same boats and on silencing slavery really quick. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to actually go into detail. In the same boats, it's been uh, it's a project we've been developing for four or five years now. What it does is it captures biographical data of Black Atlantic figures, uh, many of them Caribbean, and then does two visualizations. Uh, here's, for example, the trajectory of the life of George Lamming. I'm gonna compare George, George Lamming's life to Catherine Dunham's life. 
Actually, let me get rid of George Slamming. Let me do uh, MS Esther and uh, Catherine Donham. MS Esther is red, the red lines you see there is a trajectory of a slide, which I can manipulate here with this timeline to only give me the 30s or the 40s, whatever I want. I'm just going to keep it there because I don't have time to so the whole line. So you can see Catherine Donham, the dancer, had a much more, more expansive uh, live. Uh, her Black Atlantic was bigger than Susser, who just kept going back and forth between uh, Paris and uh, Martinique. Uh, the second visualization allows us to see the places at which the selected figures intersect in space and time. Our joke is that this is a dissertation generator. So it's like, uh, why are why are Césaire and uh, Catherine Dunham at the same time in that car? You know, like, uh, uh, this is that. Go figure that out and come back to the fan in three years, right? Uh, another project, uh, uh, more this one more recent. We, we, we released this one last year. This one tries to recenter and reimagine uh, the way that uh, we use data visualizations to represent the lives of slaves of subjects who have already gone through a process of historical dehumanization and datification. And we understand today in many big projects in the digital humanities like Slave Voyages.org, some is Jane Landers listening, uh, uh, many projects are now uh, sitting on a lot of data for uh, slave people, as the young people call them, uh, in, the enslaved. Uh, that data is there and it's being represented in many different graphical forms none of which were satisfying to us as a team because we been, we felt that the way that we use social scientific conventions to represent people were re-dehumanizing people who already went through this process. This one is an attempt at actually breaking with those traditions and creating a new type of graphic uh, that does not uh, actually re-dehumanize people, but that keeps their individuality. So this is the uh, plantation in Jamaica, the Rose Hall Plantation, these are, uh, uh, each one of these petals in this flower is a person, is a subject, for whom our team did a microhistory for every single one. Now, of course, in the social science, you would have been, for example, if I wanted to do the gender distribution of, uh, of people at the Rose Hall Plantation, uh, I would have gotten a pie chart with two colors, the women and the men. So this is kind of a pie chart, except as opposed to a pie chart where everybody is collapsed and loses their individuality, we keep the petals. Everybody keeps their, keeps their individual lives separate with all of their information and handcrafted individual microhistories. This is an example, another contribution artisanal to the world of digital humanities that we can build in the Caribbean that addresses those uh, uh, so-called silences uh, in a different key necessarily than writing. So we talked a lot about writing. Uh, uh, Vanessa and Lisa were talking about the, the abundance of writing, but there's other kinds of abundances that we are invited to explore. Ways of changing the way that we represent human beings online, the way that we imagine uh, data, the way that we imagine maps and geography. These are other places right for intervention. For the uh, for us the, the for the type of work that we are being called to do here. Okay, so wow, Alex, that's great. But like that sounds like you need to learn how to code in JavaScript. You do. Uh, you need to. Uh, you need to have time and resources to do it. How the heck are we gonna do this? Well, uh, that brings me to a five million dollar Miller uh, grant that we just got. Uh, that is mostly a redistributed grant for Caribbean digital humanities, which includes Dominican digital humanities, Puerto Rico digital humanities, Cuba digital humanities, includes all of us. Now, this is, uh, we have a website with more information. Many of you, I hope, will have by now heard of, uh, of the grant uh, and the opportunities that it affords you. There are several. Most of it, it's a redistributive grant. It's one of the, I, I wanted to put a footnote on, on something that Lisa said because Mellon Foundation now with Elizabeth Alexander is going in a completely different direction than they had in the history of Mellon. So I have a black woman at the helm and they're doing things different. But it is, uh, it is a delicate game that they're playing because right now, part, one of the problems where a lot of institutions don't, don't get these, uh, the big ones, the big grant, is because they don't have a sponsored, a sponsored programs office or a development office that is capable of managing that amount of money. 
So part of their strategy is to give the grants like Jomaira, like, like Jessica, like us, to, to, to people who are affiliated to institutions that have a huge team of development officers who can help manage the money, but help us redistribute to sub through subgrants. So this one, $5 million, is like, oh, Alex is rich. Yeah, yeah, ya está parado. <laughs> eh, no, not absolutely. A, only a very small amount of that $5 million actually goes to my projects or Kayama's project. Uh, Kayama Glover, I mean, my other, uh, one of, uh, my copy assets with me at Yale, uh, starting in July. Their other copy assets are Kelly Joseph's, Chalice Spree, and Miresa and Naja in, uh, in Puerto Rico, which I hope everybody knows. What is that? So Kayama and me, the ones at the rich institution managing the money, are getting a tiny fraction that doesn't even amount to $100,000. Everything else, the bulk of it is going to Dominica and Puerto Rico. UPR and Create Caribbean, which is a first for Mellon. Create Caribbean is not even a university. It's a nonprofit community organization that right now is a model for education in the Caribbean. Like the way that Shiler is running that, it is the most efficient, well-administered institution of higher learning in the Caribbean, except it's not a it's, it's not they don't it's not accredited so they cannot get uh degrees they give you a certificate but this the what high school students and college students are learning there is amazing it is a 21st century education that they're getting in great career so she's getting a lot of money melon would have never given them money because of this problem you need people who are tax accountants lawyers and stuff like that to handle that money because the liability is huge it, this is not like uh, i'm going to give you some money for you to do stuff there's all kinds of problems that can go wrong with these things uh, and the other one being Puerto Rico. But there, there's a lesser uh, pie, piece of this pie after a lot of money has gone to the actual Caribbean because diaspora is not doing as bad as institutions of, uh, uh, of higher learning in the actual Caribbean. We kept a little bit of the money to create opportunities for diaspora too. So I'm sure we have three programs. One of them existed uh, before in, uh, and two are new. Uh, we're going to have summer school. So you want, oh, Alex uh, does all these fancy stuff, but I don't know how to do that stuff. Well, well we can get you started. Even for the other 80 so like also we're going to have courses on Omega. You want to learn how to do one of these digital arguments, we're going to have courses for that. We got you covered. If you take a course with me, you're going to start going down the harder path, uh, the, the road less traveled. Uh, this year is going to be at the University of Miami, though. The call, the call for that already went out and closed, so we have all our students selected with all expensive things. Tu papaya. Do it. Yeah. Uh, microgrants. So microgrants can range from zero to 20K a year. And every year for the next, uh, we already gave the first round last year. We, uh, we announced in Puerto Rico the first round of recipients. The second round, the call for paper will come out in a few weeks and uh, uh, prices will be announced at the end of the year. We always have like 80K, more or less to spend every year on projects asking for from zero to 20. Now, of course, part of the, I'm here telling you, part of the pro, this is a great opportunity for you to get your project started. Whatever you need, it's a tech, it's a people to pay contributors. What is it, what does he need? What does your Caribbean Digital Humanities Project need? We're gonna just send a proposal. We're, we're gonna put together, a, 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 we put together a jury composed of people you're meeting here in this in this conference, other people from all, uh, other places in the world, Caribbean Digital Humanities. <inaudible> También. Para los cuartos, para los cuartos, pidan los cuartos. Y no, yo te di un cojonado porque en Santo Domingo yo le dije, porque yo trabajo mucho con la GN, con, I work, uh, sorry, I talk really fast a minute, because I work, because uh, I work with la, 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 la GN, la biblioteca la, la de Pedro Ricureña, with all these people, and I tell them, I have a big group, of, like, I have all the librarians on, on one WhatsApp channel, and I keep telling them, apply, y no aplicó, nobody aplicó. But anyways, don't be like that. Don't be like the Dominican librarians in Argentina. Apply. Excuse me. No, except no. <laughs> lo de allá. Lo de allá. Lo de aquí, sí. Be como Sara. Be like Sara. But, uh... <laughs> exactly. it's, it's so funny that you say that because as you speak, I am thinking 
who are in the Dutch Caribbean are online and are they listening and will they apply? It's well, I hope so. We did get some applications from the Dutch Caribbean Dutch. this year, and I want to see more. Yeah. Great. And the thing is that we're going to select people. Some uh, uh, here's a mistake a lot of people make about this microgram. So I'm telling you right now, everybody applies for the 20k for the maximum. Like the like 80 percent of people apply for the maximum. They invented stuff so they could add it so that they could get the 20 stuff. Oh my god. That's going to give you a lot less chance of getting it because there's too many people competing for the high tier and only one or two, like two maybe, are going to get the high tier. But then all the ones that applied for like 2K and 4K, they were like, oh, yeah, 2K. That is. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no skin off our back. Uh, so just something to consider. Of course, some projects are 20K projects, right? So, so, so. That's where, where you have to be really good at project management and scoping. Anyways, and the third opportunity that has been around forever, but it's the 10th year anniversary. Uh, and now uh, uh, a little bit relieved. We don't have to be shaking the, the couch at the university trying to find funding. The Mellon is covering this one. It's our Caribbean Digital Humanities Conference. The 10th year anniversary is this year, and it's probably going to be at Yale. Uh, it was traditionally held at, uh, in New York when me and Kayama were both here at Columbia University. But we're not here anymore. We sold out to the to the Yankees, uh, to the New Haven Yankees. Uh, but you are invited to apply, share your work, or come and learn from all the all, all the work that a lot of these people you're hearing from have been doing over the past ten years. Where where it's it's going to be a little bit of celebration of how much our community of people doing digital scholarship uh, has been able to accomplish. Without resources, all this time we've been like hungry for resources. This is the first time where we're actually getting grants. Where they're like, Vlog is getting grants. We're getting grants. People are getting grants for the first time, and it's like a, a, a moment of abundance and celebration. And it's a, a sign that we have been doing good work. Please show up uh, if you can at the Caribbean Digital Conference. I'll, I'll conclude by saying something that is not in, uh, by point, uh, pointing another resource to support you that is not part of the Mellon Grant because of the rules. Uh, of the Mellon rules, they're not allowed to support journals, but our journal, which has been mentioned a couple of times already today, Archipelagos, uh, is uh, now about to uh, publish its seventh issue, seventh annual issue. The last issue, Perry Collins was a guest editor in the last one, was actually focused on, on, on the Digital Library of the Caribbean, and it's one of our best issues. It is such a great, special issue. On, on on digital uh, uh, the digital library of the Caribbean. I'm trying to convince Margot to give me uh, to guest edit a special issue on the Papiamento and Dutch Caribbean with Aruba, Curacao, Suriname. I know. I think I think I got it. I think I got it. Okay. Uh, uh, I need you to help me pressure her. And and it, and it won't be a, a debut because we have a Dutchman here in the room who was on the D block issue. Oh, well, I, can, yeah. I can. I can. You want me, to, Renee? And you guest yeah. edit. We can. We can talk about it. But, uh, okay. So the. Uh, this journal is there to become a vehicle for you. For those of you, we created the journal because we understood that digital humanities doesn't get you tenure. It doesn't get you, uh, it doesn't get you jobs. So we understood that besides the work of digital projects that we do, we, in theory, should stand by itself. Uh, we might, we need to do this little extra work to be legible to the traditional structures of academia. So that's why the journal exists. It's a double-blind, peer-reviewed, traditional academic journal. People do make original arguments in there. They're a little separate than their actual digital project that they're working. And we do include voices from people working in communication and media studies, uh, new media studies, uh, and people studying TikTok and social media in the Caribbean, this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So, so that that one, it's, it's a good vehicle for that kind of work too. But something for you to keep in mind as part of the support network that I spend most of my life creating for you. Uh, so yeah, come and take my money. Uh, not even mind, but thank you very much. So we can we can talk about question and answers if you have any specific concerns. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Alex, uh, Stephanie, and uh, uh, Perry over there. Um, I think we need to swap chairs now. Yeah, but you need to um, chat, and you can stop sharing the screen. The um, okay. Um, this really is um, is a panel for you, for the users, for the students, people online, uh, to ask questions and to, to see how you 
can overcome hurdles or, or whatever. Um, so I'm going to look in the chat and see if there are questions so far. Um, there is a question here and, okay. So we go for, with the question here. We start with uh, Sophia, go ahead. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the great presentation. That was a lot. Stephanie, it's so nice to see you virtually. Uh, I met you at the Caribbean Festival Conference as well. Uh, Dr. Gill, I'm so excited to go to the Caribbean Summer Institute. And Which course did you take? I'm sadly not taking your course. No, no, no. Chat to Hindu. Yeah, I remember. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm doing the Caribbean archives. That's good. Uh, yeah. So my question is kind of, of about everything you just said when it comes to this sort of categorical division between the 80% and the 20%. Because so far at the Dominican Studies Institute, I've helped with like the JSTOR archive and digitizing the original like baptismal marriage certificate records in Samana, preserving them there, making sure that they're available without the paywall on JSTOR. Um, and I'm interested in go, moving more towards like curating stories about those, about the archival, about the archival documents. Specifically, I'm looking at travel narratives and um, short literature uh, from the 19th century. But I'm really thinking about it from like colonial 1492 into the 19th century and trying to make historical vignettes about those things. But I'm wondering, like, do you see any happy marriages or examples of people who merge like repositories with this 20% that you're talking about? If you could talk a little more about how the 20% even gets like conceptualized, like it's-, it's okay. Yeah, can I go back to the computer so I can yeah. show the, yeah. uh, I can talk. So, 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 the 80% includes the stories, right? So I said, I said that this, uh, the technical term librarian use for these things is uh, exhibits. So you have collections and exhibits and those exist in analog reality, but they also exist in digital reality, right? So we also, we do narratives and, uh, and this kind of work. Curation is just a part of any kind of collection building effort. Uh, that has to happen, right? Um, but it's still within the realm of collection building uh, and collection sharing. But here, let me let me connect those two through the Unsilenced Me Slavery Project, um, which I, I was using as an example uh, of this other 20%, right? So um, the way that I teach digital humanities at Yale, and I used to do this at Columbia too, is I teach it in two parts. So most people teach an introduction to digital humanities in one part. I think there's one semester, it's not enough. Uh, and the first part is called Architectures of Knowledge, and it's that 80%. And I talk about design, curation, metadata, and all. And that's I teach students to think like librarians and archivists uh, for for one semester. And then the second semester is the one where we do the the twenty the the, the one that follows is then the twenty percent. Let me connect that for you here. Sharing the um, silencing slavery project. Um, all right. Here's the archive for that project. Those of you who are historians are familiar with this type of historical document. You've seen it. It's the origin of modern accounting in the world. It also coincides with the dehumanization and datification of people. Uh, and it's loading. Uh, it's, uh, it's internet is a little slow. Here's the thumbnail version of it. Uh, uh, did it look, finish loading? There it is. You've seen this type of document if you're a historian, right? Uh, look at the neat ordered rows that remind you of a spreadsheet. That's because they are the precursor of the modern uh, spreadsheet. And uh, look at people arranged in rows as if they were objects, right? Uh, with numbers attached to them. Now, this is the archive. This is the archive. So we built that. That's how we start. We build the archive. And then we reinterpret the archive, but not with writing. So that's the, and look, let me tell you, I am happy that 80% of this work is being done with writing at the center, because I still believe in the power of prose. But a few people like me believe also that we need to be paying attention to these other me mechanic, mechanic toys, uh, because the world is being saturated by them. And the, and, and the, the work of his, uh, and, and the world of history is being saturated by them. Right now, I don't want to scare you too much, 
but I do inhabit a sort of like a, 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 I, I inhabit a strange world uh, when, because I do this type of work that I hang out with other people doing this type of work who understand the technology. And right now, Yale University is asking people like me to uh, to 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 calm them down with this artificial intelligence stuff, with the chat GPT. It's like they're freaking out. Mm -hmm. So I try my best to calm them down. There's a, a lot of the panic is unwarranted, but uh, but actually, some of the things that are concerning are, are not something are, are things people are, are not even they don't even have on their radar. So right now, for example, it's quite possible to create a very convincing digital archive of time. I was just seeing this example. There's a great example. I can't remember her name. It's a Greek uh, a Greek uh, digital humanist who just produced a very convincing digital archive of her family history from the 19th century until the present with photographs uh, and stories and stories about the parents and the stuff like that, uh, uh, except none of it is true. Uh, but the digital archive is has all the trappings of being a historical uh, authoritative uh, his uh, source for pri primary sources. Uh, that world is, is not coming. That world is here. Uh, it's just, you don't see it yet very well. But the capacity, uh, so, so this is what brings people like me into the 20%. Because if you don't have, if everything, all the tools and everything is just something else that technologists do and engineers do, then we're going to be receiving stuff from San Francisco and accepting it. For the rest of uh, uh, of our lives, and that is a death blow to scholarship, a scholarship that takes itself seriously as the stewards of the actual past uh, of humanity, not not some fake past, right? So that's why I encourage people to join the twenty percent and play with these toys. Not necessarily right. Yeah, only a few will join this world because it's hard. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that an answer to your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it was directed to Alex. There's uh, no question here for Stephanie and Barry. Oh, no. And we have Jensen with a question here in the room. Hi, uh, Dr. Hill. I had a question about the, the graphics that are designed. Uh, is that with, with the team that's decided on which graphics will be used for the for this, for the flower? Yeah, for the unsigned city of the flower. It took us two years discussing every possible thing that you see and don't see about this project and uh, its relationship to the dehumanization of people. So everything you see also is artisanal. This is not a platform. This is artisanally created with code. Uh, the, the petals, in order to make what are usually in the social scientific graphic conventions, wedges that are very sharp, very cold and very sharp to turn them into petals. We had to go back to high school trigonometry. And let me tell you for three months, I was a headache trying to remember our cosines and our signs uh, so that we can get them, so that we can actually represent people uh, in an organic way uh, rather than in an orga inorganic way. So yeah, the graphic you see here is, uh, and it's it's a dynamic graphic. It, it, it uh, always the point of visualization is that we're not creating a two-dimensional image. Uh, here's the matrilineage graphic, which uh, emphasizes uh, the role of the mother in the, in holding community together. So we actually put a place apart for for motherhood in this project uh, because they are the bonds uh, that keeps uh, the community together. And this graphic is generated dynamically around motherhood. So that's, um, and of course, like any other dynamic thing on the internet, when you click on it, things happen, right? So uh, this is oh, every single click and interface was designed by us through theoretical conversations with Sadia Harman, Fuentes, Jessica Marie Johnson, everybody, Elsa Valde, and like discussing, like, uh, you know, what would, Vanessa, what would Vanessa do? What would... <laughs> This is a, a team, team, uh, Celia Naylor, professor of history uh, at Barnard. I'm Monique Williams, a PhD student. Uh, uh, me and Monsieur Zapereda, um, librarian of data, data library. Uh, us four, constant, constant for two years discussions. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, Pierre? Yes, there, there's a question on the chat. Okay, there's a question on the chat. Hopefully for Perry um, and, and, and 
Here we are from Florida International with us in Alex. Uh, do you have a mailing list to share announcements for the next CPS collective? Yeah, if you go to the Caribbean Digital Scholarship website at the bottom, there's a join the mailing list. Just click on that button and it will, and it will, it's at the bottom of those. So if you can send that, put the, the link. Yeah. You're the best. Okay. I have a question for, has a mailing list. For, for all of you, for all three of you. Uh, listening to to what you all presented, um, and uh, and then sort of imagining I'm all new to this, but I want to do something. You know, that's that's also what we're discussing in this panel. Um, there, you present us with a lot of opportunities. At the same time, there is a lot already moving. Like Sophia already jumped this, you know, wonderful ship to to uh, be with you in 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 Miami. Uh, the uh, the Mellon Grant for DLOG is now working with people who are already partners. So could you speak a little to people who are now in this room or listening and thinking, oh, I want so much, but it feels like I'm sort of behind or standing, you know, at a distance from this wonderful dynamic world that you seem to be part of. Um, shall I go to uh, go to them first? I've been talking. Yes, I, I thought that too. Yeah. yeah, we will come back to you. Uh, uh, Gainesville, where are you? I don't see sure. you, but yeah. you must be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I can start, and somebody can add. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think that's really a question, and something we thought about a lot when we developed the proposal. You know, DLUC, we, we you saw the graphic, our partners are at the heart of DLUC, but one, I'd say two pieces. One part of the grant is thinking about how to bring new partners on board. Now, those partners tend to be involved in institutions from the very, very small to the very large. Um, but also some of the pieces, even pieces we've talked about today, like the open educational resources stipends, are kind of directly meant for those who aren't necessarily part of partner organizations, but might be graduate students, instructors, um, researchers in the field who are thinking about how to use, reuse, adapt things from DLOC and kind of help us build, uh, build sort of layers on top of the collection. And is there an interface? Is there someone people can speak with or? About uh, the open education resources? Yeah, about their work uh, and, you know, making these first steps. Do you have a chat box or? What's yeah, the actually, uh, I think Perry dropped a, uh, in the chat an email, uh, dlock at uf uflib.ufl.edu that goes to all of us. And what we generally tend to do is when we get a question, it goes to the person, uh, the person who can answer it best uh, usually takes the question. But I have to echo what Perry said. I think for people like the, the folks that you have in the room who may not be part of a larger institution that can uh, come on as an institutional partner, one of the ways that they can get involved with DLOC is to take part in the and, and produce an open educational resource that would live on DLOC and uh, using the DLOC resources because we don't all approach our research. We may study, uh, we, won't, we may all be historians or we may all be English uh, lit majors, but we don't all approach our work the same way. So your perspective can give people a new way of looking at things. So uh, I would definitely encourage people to uh, produce a, a one of a, an open education resource. Wonderful, thank you, Alex. Yeah, if you're a complete, complete beginner, uh, I have a couple of quick things for you. One is I I was in the middle of grad school when I when I first started in digital humanities. I spent most of my life reading theory and reading books I was a, I, I still read them a lot uh I am a <laughs> I am a, a, a doc uh, I have a doctor in philosophy in, in literature after all but um but I started very late in life I was in my mid-30s I'm older than I look uh and and now I am uh associate research faculty of digital humanities uh, at Yale University and I started late 
my dissertation doesn't even mention the word computers. Uh, anyway. So I hope that that's helpful to you. And two, to get started if you're a complete computer, begin as a user. Read the issues in the journal, find out what are the projects that people are doing. There's a, we put together, uh, go to DLog and look at all the projects they've done. Uh, we put together a, um, a directory of Caribbean digital scholarship projects that includes all the projects you've seen today. It's included in, the, are included in the directory already, accounted for. Uh, I'm sharing my screen here. Let me open it up. It's called Caridisco. Uh, and uh, just start engaging with first blacks in America. Sorry, and like go deep into this project the same way that you wanted to learn from books by reading them. You want you wanted to learn how to produce a book or a good essay. Well, you you practice a lot by reading them. Well, with the same, you want to you want to someday be able to produce these type of research resources. Then uh, start exploring them. Uh, there's so many, there's so much activity. It's so rich in the Caribbean. Uh, all the kinds of stuff that, that, that we are doing. Here's a Dominican uh, related one. Uh, First Blacks in America is here somewhere. Uh, and so is Musica Dominicana, the, uh, uh, the Historia de la Musica Dominicana in Nueva York. It's also here. And, and almost everything you saw today is already accounted for. We, re we refresh the directory every year, uh, collecting throughout the year everything we see new that pops up on the internet. So that's my, my advice for mm -hmm. beginners. Don't begin by like learning, taking a coding course. It's pretty stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. Learn by understanding what how, how these objects allow us to know, to learn. Because mm -hmm. we're doing this not because we wanna do fancy digital anything. We're doing this because of the knowledge that these objects carry, the ideas, the arguments. That's what's important to us in the digital humanities. We're not engineers. Uh, so. That's my advice mm -hmm. for complete beginners. I hope that's helpful if you're a complete, complete beginner who wants to go <laughs> out through this. You have questions online? Uh, yeah, I have two, two questions coming online. The first one is Isabel Espinal asking what was the name of the tool that Alex mentioned? Was it Wax? Oh, for uh, the alternative one, alternative that works in uh, Wax was designed as a replacement for Omega. It is. Uh, it, has, it has inspired, it has inspired, uh, uh, so you heard the, Perry and Stephanie, my colleagues, talk about how uh, uh, like they're aware that we cannot make it image heavy and this kind of stuff. Uh, it brought to this kind of, a, 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 this tool and other tools and conversations we've been having over the past 10 years, because we're all in the more or less in the same community, has inspired awareness of the differences in ecosystems, uh, in technological ecosystems and infrastructures around the Caribbean and in the United States, because we work with Rikers Island. We had a project that we worked with Rikers Island for three years. Three years and that's like uh the developing world inside the you know like uh, there's no computers allowed etc uh, um uh what hold on i'm googling it uh so that you can i can give you the link or i can give it to you later it's uh if you google let me see wax alex steve uh there's the link uh, uh when it loads um this is the software uh, and it's a tool that is not meant for beginners. If you're a beginner, beginner, I just had an email from another beginner. I get, I get this once in a while. It's like, but I can't use this tool and I am so sorry. But in order to be able to use this tool, you have to uh, develop this infrastructure. Uh, Omega allows you to begin if you're a beginner. You, know, uh, you can start right away. You can start building collections. This tool, it's way more robust than, than, than Omega. It will work in environments without electricity, without uh, without uh, uh, internet, uh, stuff like that, because it can travel through USBs. The products of these things can travel through USBs and sneaker nets. Uh, part of the seed idea was born in Cuba, where they only have 3% penetration to the internet, and there's also a little bit of censorship for LGBTQ work and this kind of stuff. And so we decide, a lot of the design is thinking about how we're going to create something that can help scholars in Cuba. Uh, and this is the result of that. Uh, this is the tool, mm -hmm. WAG. So it's mini comp for minimal computing. There are other tools in this ecosystem. And just for a little context, uh, I remember reading in Ruth Karizam's wonderful book on digital humanities and in a yeah. colonial yeah. life new, world, uh, new that world. There, she, that's how I, I sort of learned about your work uh, and how you sort of proved how uh, in, a, in a global world, you know, the digital, works and there was this project the digital 
for 2000s? They are around the age in 80. Yeah, days. yes. That, so, so something you don't know because besides my Caribbean studies tag, I also and just for context. Yeah. In in why you are so um, dedicated to mini computing and and making things accessible. Yeah, because I've traveled all over the world. So it's one of my greatest shames in life that I actually, as a scholar, I've never done any work in Dominican studies. And I, my joke, I know, I know. My joke is always that when I go home, I just want to hang out with my mom. And uh, <laughs> <Who's that? laughs> by the way, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, uh, but of course, um, while I've been ignoring my own country and my own roots, I've been paying attention to the rest of the world. I've traveled all over this planet, studying the way that people, uh, the way that people in the humanities and in libraries and archives in Asia, in Africa, in South America, in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe. I'm going to Kyrgyzstan next. Uh, uh, the way they, what infrastructure do they use in order to, to create uh, an environment for their scholarship? Mm -hmm. Remember, this is not only about digital, though we pay attention and we have a conference called Architectures of Knowledge where we get together in places that don't have an Interpol extradition agreement so that we can hang out with the pirate librarians who circulate copyrighted materials in places that cannot afford them. Mm -hmm. So this is like the infrastructure, the rich architecture of knowledge in the world is something that has made me passionate all yeah. my life, understanding everywhere in the world how these things uh, circulate and operate and the inequality that are built in the global system mm -hmm. of knowledge uh, circulation. It is there that I've, in my travels, that I have learned uh, how we have this tendency sometimes to accept tools that, or standards uh, that are built in the, in the global north according to a certain kind of infrastructure that is imagined to be universal, but it's nothing mm -hmm. but universal. Yeah. yeah. Now, I just wanted to share that context. It's, it's so important. We talked about this morning as well. But yeah. Pierre, you have more questions. Uh, I to get to the other question because I think it echoes uh, what we also discussed this morning by Vanessa Valdez and Elisela Costa. Uh, what advice do panelists have for independent scholars interested in scaling their digital humanities mm -hmm. project to be able to support other independent scholars in the Caribbean? As well as share knowledge widely and ideally move in ways that remain unrestricted by the tenure expectations of the university. Wow. And the question is for? Yeah. It's for the panel. The panel list, okay. Harry uh, and Stephanie must have insight on this. Yeah, let them go. Harry and Stephanie. Yeah, Can you uh, repeat the question? Because I, I don't know about Perry, but I didn't hear it. <laughs> What are you, you can doing? See it in the chat, too, it's Stephanie. You, in the Q and A. Oh, it's in the chat as well. Okay. Yeah, in the, in the Q and A button, you can see yes. that. So and basically, independent scholars can support each other. Yeah. And uh, that's and, a wonderful question. Develop their projects without being constrained by by what the university expects from yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And, you know, I think even the grant projects that we've laid out show some of the challenges of doing that in that, um, you know, we're still talking about relatively small amounts of funding. As Alex said, so many of the larger, the, we're talking about, at least when we're talking about scale in terms of funding, we're often talking about institutional awards. And so being an independent scholar in that way can be a challenge if you're not affiliated with an institution getting those awards. Um, I think one thing that I hope we've done well with DLOC is to try to be aware of a broad range of expertise, including folks like Margot, Alex, others who are involved in DLOC on our various um, advisory groups as consultants, um, being part of the conversation um, helps us know who's out there when we're when we do have funding and we can give it to somebody. And we're not necessarily seeking out people who are affiliated with institutions. So I hate to say that the the way to scale and to keep going is to associate with institutions, but I think sometimes that's the case and being part of conversations like this. I, I would agree yeah. with that. And also um, being aware of who is doing stuff that's similar to you so that you can collaborate. I am uh, the, the newbies that Alex was talking about in terms of digital humanities. I'm like, oh my God, why is he calling me out like that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so um, 
being aware of other people who are doing things that are similar, not necessarily exactly the same, but similar to what you're doing and partnering with them, you know, working, collaborating with them. That is something that I have come to see is a, a significant part of doing digital humanities. And if I could go back just very quickly to uh, what advice for the new person who's just now starting with the digital humanities, start small. Uh, that was one of the best pieces of advice that I received when I was working on my dissertation. And if you're working on your dissertation, this one, this is a bonus for you. Um, take small bites. Uh, don't think about it in its totality. Don't try to tackle like the biggest, most complex thing. My first digital humanities project was to make a story map, which still lives on DLock. <laughs> and it was pretty straightforward. And I was so proud of myself when I finished doing it. You'll feel a sense of accomplishment. And, you know, when you have the time, you'll be uh, inspired to continue to do more. That's great advice. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the questions. Wonderful uh, to also think about the independent scholars. Yes, Professor. I, I, no, I, I just want to say something in compliment to the panel. Uh, Alex did talk about, you know, what the, the status of the digital humanities in the academic progress uh, people have in their jobs. And um, I want to say something encouraging that um, the, the academy changes. It changes glacially at a glacial pace, <laughs> but it changes through particular strategies that people have. And that strategy essentially um, is living a double life for a while. And that is moving forward in all the traditional paths while developing all of these other expertise. And um, I've been a chairperson, so I've been involved with the mentoring of faculty as they come along. And sometimes we have let's, let's put, made part of a very impressive dossier less visible for a while because we knew that part of the dossier would not be understood by the people currently making decisions. Yeah. But there are generational changes that happen. And the people who lead their double lives and achieve what they want come into positions in which they can explain the other half of their life in a protected manner and can move people forward in those in, in those in those ways. So I would say patience and stealth are very important <laughs> aspects of, of, of this. It will not happen this year or next year. Uh, but to be involved in this and to come armed when one has literally, I have to say, the power in the uh, in the academy to make decisions and be part of those decisions and to vote on things is very important. And for people to become involved now uh, at the level of, because uh, I encourage my graduate students to develop these expertise now uh, and because they will live with them for the rest of their academic career. I think what you said, sorry, what's your name? Jerry Carlson. Jerry, hi. Nice college and Graduate Center. Nice to meet you, Jerry. Uh, um, and, and I agree 100%. A lot of my career has been uh, a very uh, stealthy. I think with the the word marriage was used. Rebel, yes, yeah. rebel was used. I have mostly done most of uh, the things that now are uh, starting to be legible to 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 people around me by ignoring uh, what they told me I was supposed to do. But but I want to add something to what you just said. You see, you heard me say that I will never have a tenure position, which means I will never have voting rights. Right. 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 Uh, that will never have decision making rights. So, for people like me, but I want to, I want, I really hope that I continue to be the exception, even as I create these infrastructures that allow people to go down that path that you just described. Um, people like me ha are building a shadow economy where we vote on different issues, uh, and we have soft power within the university system. The university does crave people like me because uh, I get the department in the New York Times a lot more than every other faculty with voting rights. Uh, I, so I also have a, a lot of support. I, ha I have a, if you fire me, there will be people protesting at your door uh, that you fire me. So I have built this alternative world uh, and I survive and thrive. And that, in fact, I, I would say I would leave, I'm doing quite well in that world where I don't vote. 
Uh, and those things that people think is very important to vote on, half of the time they're not. Uh, really, is that important to be in that voting meeting? I was like, my joke to my chair is always like, I'm not in that one because I don't have the right to vote. Uh, thank you. That's one hour of reclaimed time. I can go do something else. Uh, so my encouragement for those of you who are really insane, really insane, is to actually just build your own path. Forget about one day achieving power. So this is the opposite of Vanessa. Vanessa's mm -hmm. doing it great. Uh, uh, Vanessa's uh, thing is like one day, little by little, she's associate provost now, you know, like next step is what provost she will have more voting power than almost everybody at the university uh, and that's a great path but it's not for everybody uh, especially uh, with people of color it's not double the work it's triple the work i'm an immigrant it's triple the work so for if you're feeling particularly insane and chaotic there's this other alternative path in which you're not seeking to actually become a powerful voter of the university you will be making decisions in the underground that you create. Uh, the, the alliance between both sectors is very important. Uh, they work together, just so that we're clear. Yeah. They, every sector is aware of the existence of the other, and they coexist in the modern academy just fine. In fact, my chair and I are very, very close. He rules the kingdom of voting, and I rule the underground. And together, we we give life to the department. That's, <laughs> that's the intent accord, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry, for that question, uh, for that comment. Thank you all. We need to wrap up. Um, I want to thank Stephanie and Perry as well down south in Gainesville. Um, we don't unfortunately have time for some surprise ending questions, but you've all, uh, you know, added so much to the conversation. So thank you all, Stephanie, Perry and Alex for being here in this panel. We now have, I think, a brief uh, uh, break yeah. and then uh, we'll continue. In I think ten ten minutes or so, a little under ten. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.